Diamond B Sports presents the American Sports Cavalcade with your host, the Tennessee Cowboy, Ed Bruce, and Brock Yates and Steve Evans, the American Sports Cavalcade. I'm Ed Bruce. Right now, I'm sitting on the guardrail at the Sunshine Drag Strip in St. Petersburg, Florida. This strip's pretty quiet right now. But in Brainerd, Minnesota, at the North Star Nationals, the top alcohol funny cars and the top fuel dragsters will be busting that quarter mile in less than six seconds at speeds of over 200 miles per hour. As always, my good buddies and racing experts, Brock Yates and Steve Evans, are there to call the action for you. The reason I'm here at Sunshine Drag Strip is to meet one of the real legends of drag racing history, Art Malone and he's gonna fill us in on some of that history. But right now, let's go back to exciting racing with Steve and Brock and Brainerd. I'm sure this pair behind us would understand what we're about to see today on American Sports Cavalcade. That's the legendary Minnesota logger, Paul Bunyan and his giant blue ox, Babe. Hi, I'm Brock Yates from the land of the sky blue waters in Bemidji, Minnesota, where just down the road, we're gonna see drag racing, NHRA style, at Brainerd for the North Star Nationals. And I've got to believe that Paul Bunyan, being a giant in his own right, would understand driving a 3,500 horsepower, 250 mile an hour dragster of the type we're going to see running today. But speaking of giants, let's go to Brainerd from my old broadcasting partner, Steve Evans. Brock, as long as you're out there looking for Paul Bunyan, why don't you see if you can find the Easter Bunny, too? Ah, missed again. I have not snuck away to the carnival, Yates. I am at the drag race that thinks it's a county fair. Drag racing has always been very, very popular in this part of the country on a local level, but they never had a facility fine enough to host a full NHRA national event. They do now, since last year, Brainerd International Raceway turned the front straightaway of the road course into one of the nation's finest drag strips. And in only two years, this event has become the biggest race that Brainerd Raceway hosts any time during the year. There's hundreds of acres for camping and thousands of people have taken advantage of that, many of them camping for the last three nights. You look around here and it really does have a county fair atmosphere. All the food and refreshment stands, the souvenir stands are run by the local business people. Tremendous community involvement. They're just finishing up the final time trials and I've still got time to maybe uh, win a little bear here to take home for the little lady. See you back here at the track. I need some more balls over here. I'm not done yet. Well, while Evans practices, let's go back to a couple of days earlier in qualifying here at Brainerd when Gary Beck electrified the crowd with yet another one of his record-shattering runs, 546, 253 miles an hour. Earlier, Steve talked with Gary about his speed secrets. Gary, I never turned down an invitation, so here we are to learn a few of the speed secrets as to why you're running so well at this track. Yes, Steve. Well, I'm glad you come by uh, to show you what we're trying to do here at Brainerd this weekend. And there's really four things that we should talk about. And, uh, uh, well, really, you know, we know the car can run uh, 5.4 elapsed times on very good racetracks. Well, Brainerd here is, uh, you know, is certainly a very good racetrack, but I think as the racers, they don't call it an excellent traction racetrack. It's sufficient, but what we try to do is help the racetrack out. And, uh, and create our own traction. So we've done the four things to the car this weekend to try to keep it to run the 5.4s. So far, it's working. And they are. Well, to start with, we worked with the tires. And we, we, need, we knew we needed real large tires. And the tires will come a little to the small or a little to the large of a certain size. And we went out in California and went down to the Carroll Shelby's, uh, the Goodyear plant out there and, and found the biggest tires he had. I would say these tires here in rollout, the measurement around the tire is a good, good two inches bigger than any of the other cars here at the racetrack. And, and if you look over at Larry's car when you have a chance, you can visually see the difference in his, his set of tires. We couldn't get big tires for both cars. We got only one set here. They're on our car here today. We also went to center line and got some rear rims to accent the tires. So we've got a very good traction combination in the tire area. Then to, the tire tries to grow real quick off the start line. So we've added a 42 pound weight bar right back here in the back of the car. That allows the tire to stay flatter just a little longer um, off the launching pad. And it creates uh, so that you can carry that launch out to half track. That also appears to be working. We're not spinning the tires off the pad near as much as we did last year when we were here. 
And then we've gone into the clutch and we built a clutch special here for Brainerd that, that operates a little softer and through all the way through low gear and goes uh, and is still capable of locking up tight down in high gear. And as, as you can see, the car ran 253 miles an hour, so you know the clutch is locked up real good. Now with the uh, inspection cover off, you can adjust that clutch between rounds for changing track conditions. You know, very seldom does a racer share this kind of information with us, and, and we thank you. Well, it's uh, it's not a, a big secret to, to anybody. Most of the racers come over here, they watch and know what we're doing. They they, they, they ask our clutch people what kind of parts we're buying, so they know <laughs> they know that. Uh, they can see the weight bar on the car. The tires, uh, they play with tires too, big and small. It's not a big secret, but we went a little extreme and got a, gi a real big set. And, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, there are some things there, but it's working nicely for us. Thanks again. All righty. As always, Gary Beck trying to outthink the competition as we see Doug Kerhulis from Bakersfield, California, coming to the line for the first round of top fuel competition. Stay with us. The professional pit area here at Brainerd International Raceway is virtually empty because they're all in the staging lanes for first round action. And what better way to start our coverage of the North Star Nationals than the fastest accelerating vehicles in the world, Top Fuel Eliminator. Round one competition will feature this man, Jody Smart, San Antonio, Texas, versus a Californian, Doug Krahulis. Smart this year won his first ever NHRA national event. That was the Mile High Nationals in Denver, Colorado. Doug Krahulis still looking to make his mark. As a matter of fact, uh, Steve, it was Doug Kerhulis that Jody Smart beat at the Mile High Nationals in the final round, so this will be kind of a rematch. The first time this pair, I think, has gone against each other since that moment. We'll see whether uh, Doug can uh, come back. Jody Smart performing the tire heating burnout as the crew for Doug Kerhulis primes the injector. Brock, we've already got a problem. Jody Smart has lost a blower belt on his engine. You can see the sheet metal on the body is kicked out. Jody Smart will be a loser here in the first round for mechanical reasons. That's a shame, Steve, because that belt often is an Achilles heel on uh, these big blown engines, and nobody seems to have been able to solve the problem. So it'll be a single pass for Doug Kerhulis. Naturally, he'll be going for best time in low ET because he gets lane choice in the second round. Brock, it'll be interesting to see if indeed Kerhulis makes a full pass here on the quarter mile at Brainerd. He is not overburdened with spare parts. He may save his equipment. Jody Smart is out of his car in a safe location. You were talking about the blower belt earlier. Sometimes, Brock, that is just an indicator of other problems. A C, there's the belt in the uh, official's hand. An indicator of a C supercharger or another malady with the motor. Occasionally, you're right, the belt does break. But generally, uh, it is caused by something else. Well, no matter what, Steve, it's a tough break for Jody Smart. He's one of the best liked guys in the top fuel ranks, a very popular man who runs a big wholesale parts warehouse uh, for speed equipment in San Antonio, Texas. As Doug Kahulis backs up to the line, earlier Steve had a chance to talk with him. You got a brand new car, Doug. Give you a little extra confidence? Yeah, well, it did. Uh, we've been having a lot of problem here, Steve. Uh, in the last two races, it's been running 580s, and um, it did that on the hill at Denver. So. We blew an engine up yesterday. I, uh, it didn't go into uh, high gear, so um, we're having a little bit of problems. We put a new engine. It should run good, but the car is excellent. Just the uh, the air fuel ratio is not quite right, right, so we put a new uh, 1371 blower on it. Should burn the fuel a little better. Back to the line where Doug Kerhulis will make a single pass, and as Steve said earlier, the question is, will he try to run hard or will he take his chances on the second round lane choice? As Jody Smart watches, Steve, tough break. Got to be frustrating for Smart. You heard Doug Kerhulis say, Brock, he put a 1371 blower on. Here goes Doug Kerhulis, and he lifts off the throttle. I had a feeling he would do that, Brock. You heard him say that he blew an engine yesterday. He is just not overstocked with parts and pieces, and this uh, could become an endurance contest before the day is over. For Jody Smart, however, he'll be in a position to loan parts because he's out of competition. Well, let's go to the next pairing here in the first round at Top Fuel. Gary Ormsby will go against... A man we've heard an awful lot about in recent months in top fuel ranks, Joe Amato, the Pennsylvania speed shop and speed equipment operator who's been so successful recently. Indeed he has. He was a, an alcohol dragster racer for a number of years. And believe me, he was not greeted with open arms in top fuel because the guys knew he would adapt very quickly. A lot of the drivers we'll be seeing today, Brock, race for a living. For Joe Amato, it's a hobby, one he enjoys very much. It's kind of uh, his golf course, so to speak. 
Well, he sure does uh, play par golf on this uh, particular quarter mile. The man is very quick and very consistent as we see Gary Ormsby doing his burnout. This is the first year, Brock, that Gary Ormsby has joined the national tour. He's a car dealer from Roseville, California. So in all, Steve, we've got a pair of relative newcomers in terms of the top fuel ranks here at Brainerd, and the fans will be interested to see how this pairing goes. Ormsby versus Amato. And I suppose you've got to consider Joe Amato the favorite among the two. Earlier, Steve had a chance to talk to his competition. Okay, it's got to be a big thrill to finally, after all these years drag racing, to be out here really with the big boys and the big girl. It is. We got the good crew now, and everything's going good for us. All right, tell me about uh, this first round race. Uh, we feel confident he qualified a little better than we did, but we'll step up this round. We found our problem in qualifying, and I think we'll step up and I think we'll get there first. Okay, is there a, a difference in lanes, do you think, Gary? It doesn't seem to be. We ran both lanes, and it seems to be pretty even, both lanes. So Joe has lane choice. Which lane do you think he'll put you in? Uh, I believe he'll probably put me in the left lane, which is fine. We ran our best run in the left lane, so make any difference really to the lane. Are you intimidated at all by, let's say, a guy like Amato that's won two races this year or a three-time world champ like Shirley now that you're finally really getting to race him in the big time? No, I, it doesn't make any difference to me who I run. I don't pay attention to who I run. How long have you been doing this? Uh, since 1964. Another overnight uh, sensation. Yeah. Another overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> A nice guy, Brock Yates, from Northern California, and believe me, very popular around Sacramento and San Francisco and the Los Angeles area drag strips, Gary Ormsby. Well, this is kind of an East versus West uh, competition, Steve. It's interesting to note how complex the lane choices are in this kind of drag racing, that uh, the thought that goes into uh, either choosing it yourself or being given it by your competition. Ormsby staging in the far lane. He was right. That's where Joe Amato put him. A good drag race. Side by side, but it is Joe Amato at the far end. Amato at 563, an impressive elapsed time, 247 miles an hour. Let's see if anyone had an advantage right off the mark. Well, if anybody, it was Joe Amato in the near lane, but they both made a fine start. Very little tire spot. The car's running straight and through down the drag strip, but Joe Amato establishes himself through just sheer horsepower and advantage over Gary Hornsby and wins by a little over a car length. Well, next to Gary Beck, who's running in another time zone, Joe Amato is the quickest car in top fuel. That was a 563. 560, that's our fastest time of the race here. We're really, the car's running good. We ran four 560s in qualifying, and Timmy just has the car tuned up, and it's just, you know, performing flawlessly. We only put one piston and two rings in, in all four passes. So we're just trying to keep it dialed in and, you know, go one round at a time. We have to run Shirley if she beats Snow this round. She's going to be tough. And then hopefully when we get to Beck in the final, he's going to have an easy final because he just got by the, well, the guy we thought could beat him, Jody, yeah. just broke his blower belt, which is bad luck. But that helps us in the points because Jody's in front of us too. So all the people that are in front, as long as they go out, it'll definitely help. Here comes your crew. Congratulations. Okay. A happy man, Joe Amato here at Brainerd, Minnesota, and we'll be back with more first round top fuel action after this. No race cars in the world make more horsepower than top fuel dragsters, and that's what we're featuring here at Brainerd International Raceway. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates. It's top fuel eliminator round number one, Gene Snow versus the three-time world champion, Shirley Muldowney. Now, we've got a couple of real veterans in this uh, pairing, Steve. Uh, Maldani, of course, uh, we don't have to talk much about her background. As you said, a longtime veteran and a three-time world champion. But Gene Snow, he was a world champion in funny cars back in 1970. He virtually invented the funny car category. Snow, who for a long time, like Shirley, raced for a living, now he's in the oil business. And they say down in Texas that Snow could find oil with a popsicle stick. Well, he dropped out of racing for a while to really get serious about digging, didn't he? He went from uh, racing diggers, as they used to call these things, uh, to digging for oil and found it, I guess. Boy, he found a lot of it. Well, today he needs speed because his rival is the champ. Steve talked to her earlier. Well, surely if you can't be number one, you might as well be number four because then you draw the slowest car in the field. Yes, that's an ideal place to be for first round. Now, Gene Snow struggled to qualify. I didn't know that he had problems. He's usually a very, you know, a front runner and pretty good driver. 
But it doesn't matter really. Race day's a whole nother ball game. It really is. Conditions are different. The racetrack comes in a little better, and I think everybody has an equal chance. What do you think it's going to take to win this race? We know that Gary Beck is potentially can run 540s, but uh, now that can be problems in itself running that quick. Consistency is what, is what will win the race, I think. Uh, it's a little hard to compete with that at this time, but uh, I would say even a 70 could win the race. Rate the racetrack for me, the racing surface. Uh, it's an ideal racetrack. Uh, the facility just offers a lot for everybody. It's uh, it's a pleasure to come to Brainerd. We'd like all the racetracks to be as good, but we're all, we're looking forward to Indy. That's my favorite racetrack. All the fans here are looking forward to this race for sure. Gene Snow, the old veteran, against the reigning world champion, Shirley Muldowney. What a pairing, Steve. You know, Brock, in that interview earlier, I sensed that Shirley Muldowney was a little tight. Uh, maybe not quite on her game. The normally gregarious lady uh, is concerned about a race car. She's won only one race this year, the season opening one nationals, and I think she's worried about Gene Snow. She very well could be because Snow is a obviously a very competitive driver all kinds of poise at the starting line he's been doing it for so many years you just can't rattle him like you can some of the uh, younger and less experienced drivers so Shirley Muldowney in the far line the famous pink car against the black gold machine of Gene Snow Shirley is the last of stage and we are ready Shirley Muldowney is off the mark first Shirley Muldowney and Gene Snow it is Shirley Muldowney what a great drag race. Muldowney wins it at a 567, 253. But Gene Snow gave her everything she wanted and then some as far as a comp competitor was concerned. Look at this. As they head into the lights, less than half a car length wins it. Steve's with the winner. Well, this lady knows that she was in a very close car race. You won with a 567 to his 68. Are you kidding? No. It was all on the starting line because he was there all the way down the race course. You left by a couple of hundreds, and that's what you needed. Got lucky. <laughs> He's awfully good. My guys are happy. I can see him right now. And you know, you needed that kind of elapsed time because next round you'll have to match wheels with Amato, who just ran a 63. Yeah, uh, I, I want to race, Joe. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> the lady always looks forward to racing. What a competitor. One of the greatest racers in the history of this sport. And is she happy? Look out, Joe Amato, because Shirley Maldani is ready to race him. And let's go down to the starting line, Steve, where we've got a pair of beautiful blue dragsters ready to go. We've seen these a number of times before, haven't we? Well, you may think you have double vision here when we see both cars. It is Larry Miner of Hemet, California, against his employee, Gary Beck. Now, Beck, as I said earlier, is running in another time zone. The only driver to ever run beneath... 550. He has made like 10 runs in the 540s. In fact, these are the two quickest automobiles in the world. They did not mean to race each other here. In fact, they tried to qualify on opposite sides of the ladder so that Larry Miner could run interference for Beck. Their goal this year is to make Gary Beck the world champion. And Brock, to be very candid about it, the fix is in. Miner intends to lose. I'm sure he does. Larry Miner, the very successful farmer and off-road racer from California, and there he is, the fastest man in the history of this sport, Gary Beck from El Toro, California. You know, Brock, it amazes me, uh, their goal being to make Beck the world champion. They even bring the minor car to the starting line. I mean, it costs $200 just to start one of these cars. Uh, I think they feel they own obligation to the race fans to have two cars up in the starting line. That is Bernie Federley, and I do not envy him. He is the crew chief on both of these cars, and the man literally runs his legs off. Now checking the minor car. Previously, he checked the Beck car as the two of them come to the starting line. Well, this will definitely be a race uh, against time for Beck, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what Miner does, whether he tries to actually race him or whether he just goes down there. What he loves to do is race Gary Beck for the fun of it and lose. <laughs> well, he, he's only been driving these things for a couple of years. Wait a minute. Hold it. Gary Beck's car never even left the starting line. Apparently a problem. This is deja vu. A repeat of the Cajun Nationals. We have in the near lane a reluctant winner here in the first round. Gary Beck had a problem. Lord knows what it is. Larry Miner wins and didn't want to. At 34 miles an hour. An incredible turn of events here. And we'll be back to find out what happened to the Miner Beck team after this.
we're back at Brainerd, Minnesota, where we've just seen the fastest drag racer in history beaten at 34 miles an hour. Let's go to Steve Evans and Larry Miner for an explanation. Well, Larry, I know you wanted to go up there and have a good race with Gary and uh, see Gary get the points, but again, it just doesn't work out. I don't know. There's something about it. Uh, I don't know what happened to Gary. I don't know what's wrong. Uh, I just don't know. <laughs> I guess we'll just have to win this race. I guess so. It's hard to be a reluctant winner sometimes, isn't it? Well, yeah, I just don't know what's know what's going on with Gary's car. You know, uh, guys run so good, you know, and, uh, you know, I didn't know anything was wrong with it. And, uh, well, one thing we know now, you're going to have some excellent help getting this car ready to try to stop the rest of these drivers. I just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Brock Yates is down in Gary Beck's pit area to try to get some answers to a very confusing first-round drag race when Beck lost to the car owner, Larry Miner. Gary, uh, every time you race your teammate, Larry Miner, uh, the bizarre seems to come forth. Uh, we saw it happen at, uh, in Cajun, and now uh, again today, what exactly transpired when he went to the line with the car? Well, today was uh, yeah, unfortunate for myself here. Um, we had uh, good oil pressure uh, on the burnout, and then, and then it went away, and what happens is we had a check valve and the oil pump stick open, and the, the engine goes to zero oil pressure, and there's uh, nothing that you can do to the car to repair it at that time. And, and uh, uh, racing Larry, I mean, we gave him, tried to give him the signal of what was happening, but he didn't understand it clearly. You know, I mean, certainly in our camp, the effort is for me to win the rounds of racing sure. and, uh, and for him to help us out the best he can. But, you know, uh, as it turns out, then you lose, you know. So we're, we're in a bad spot, uh, maybe. We have to go out and win the car with, uh, the race with Larry's car, and that's what we intend to do here today. The North Star Nationals is the youngest of the National Hot Rod Association's World Championship Series events and is located in Brainerd, Minnesota in the heartland of vacation country. Well, Brock, while you're out soaking up the local color, you'll remember that you asked me to find you some accommodations close to the racetrack. I've done better than that. I have found you a room right here inside the racetrack, the blue little pointed tent. You have a confirmed reservation. And you won't be lacking for company either. There's over 20,000 drag racing fans camped in the infield of Brainerd International Raceway's road course, the front straightaway of which is now one of the world's finest drag strips, and you're only about 50 feet from the cars and stars of the North Star Nationals. And knowing what a sport you are, Brock, I have signed you. There's your alarm clock. That'll function every morning about this time. Anyway, I signed you up for all of the recreational activities, including one of my personal favorites. <laughs> oh, Evans, a ringer through the magic of television. But believe me, the action's going to be a lot hairier here than horseshoes. So stick around for more from Brainerd, Minnesota. Already, the injectors are being primed as the first round of AA Fuel Funny Car competition is only moments away. But first, Brock, what is this magic of television stuff? I don't want to hear it. You know how many hours I practiced to make that ringer right on cue? Sure, Evans, and I've seen you draw to an inside straight, too. If you got it, you got it. The first of the 3,000 horsepower nitro-burning engines has come to life. The electric starter is removed from the upper pulley on the supercharger, and soon the body will latch down. Nothing makes more noise, nothing makes more smoke in all of all racing than nitro funny cars. Absolutely right, Steve. Unquestionably the most spectacular automobiles on four wheels. And here comes young Tom Anderson from upstate New York in an unsponsored automobile. Really one of the guys that gets the biggest bang for the buck in this league. He's done very well against Frank Hawley, run against him a couple of times, but Anderson has never yet won an NHRA World Championship event. It may be his day today. He's been running very well. He's confident, drives very well, but this man may be the best driver of them all in funny cars. Frank Hawley, the reigning world champion from London, Ontario. Steve Evans had a chance to talk with Frank Hawley earlier. Well, Frank Hawley and Tom Anderson have been going at it hammer and tong all season long, but he's ready for you this time, it looks like. Yeah, he's, he's running really fast. We've struggled a little bit. Uh, we raced him in the final at uh, Winter Nationals and the Mile High Nationals. We got him uh, twice there, and I think things run in threes. So if, uh, if he wants to beat us, I think he's going to have to run another 588. Tom Anderson has completed his burnout in that yellow and white Mercury LN7-bodied funny car, and he will come to the line in a few moments. 
for another exchange of uh, niceties with Frank Holly over there in the Chi Town Hustler. A man, Steve, that I think is probably as good squeezing the lights as anybody in the Funny Car League. Well, since they started winning a lot of races and quite a bit of money, Frank Holly actually doesn't push the light as hard as he once did. You got to be hungry, like a Tom Anderson is, to really go for those quick reaction times. Well, he'll need everything he's got because he's carrying number eight on that car, but the other car, the Chi Town Hustler, carries that gold number one, Steve. And that means he carries an awesome reputation into this race. And also is leading again the points towards yet a second world championship. So it's Holly in the far lane. In the near lane is Tom Anderson as they move into stage very, very carefully. And they leave right together, but suddenly Anderson loses traction. Has to get off the throttle momentarily. And that's all the break Frank Holly needs to pull it out at 5.92 seconds, 241 miles an hour. Frank Holly goes into round number two. You notice that there was no parachute on the Tom Anderson car. Not to worry. This is probably the longest drag strip in the world because they can literally coast all the way around the road course. The parachute, uh, not all that necessary, Brainerd. All right, Steve, and the next pair of funnies come to the line. This is the Corvette-bodied car of Ken Vini, one of the very few Corvettes running in uh, the funnies. But I think we'll see a proliferation of them very soon, Brock. They're so good-looking and popular with the fans. Sure are. Everybody loves a Corvette. And uh, certainly Ken Beanie's automobile beautifully trimmed out as he does his burnout. And his competition, Kenny Bernstein in the Mercury LN7, a very heavily sponsored automobile, a very active drag racer, but a guy who's been in a pretty serious slump recently, Steve. He has, Brock, and I think that's because of his all-or-nothing approach. Kenny and his crew chief, Dale Armstrong, they'll either win or not qualify. There's not much in the middle. Well, I'm sure Beanie's thinking upset here against Bernstein, uh, hoping that he can prolong that slump. But uh, on the other hand, Bernstein, a man, very, very serious competitor, a guy who just never quits, a 24-hour drag racer. So as they get ready, let's go to Steve Evans and Frank Holly. Well, Frank Holly said things run in threes, and that's the third time. This time you got him on the starting line. You whole shot at him four hundreds. Four hundreds. Boy, I'll tell you, that's something. But awful pumped up. These guys work awful hard to get the car running good. All I have to do is leave on time, and it's nice when I can do it once in a while. Did you ever even see him down the racetrack, Frank? No, never. Never at all. It's great. We're going to be back next round. <laughs> Let's go to Brock with Tom Anderson. Tom almost too much power, huh? Yeah, that's what it was. It was too much power. Plus, the racetrack's getting a little tighter, and we made a little bit too much power, and it went into a small shake, and when it shakes a little bit, and then it pulls the tires into smoke, and we just overpowered the racetrack. Stayed in it all the way, though. Tried to catch him, huh? Well, I lifted once, and then got back in and tried to catch him. Well, a super show anyway, 588 to first round. You go home thinking about that anyway. Yeah? Oh, well, we'll do better next time. Absolutely. Good job. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, the motors are coming up to temperature. Kenny Bernstein backing up from the long, smoky burnout. We're just about ready for the second of four races here in round number one. Kenny Bernstein from Dallas, Texas, a former restaurateur, now, as Brock said, a 24-hour-a-day drag racer. Drag racing has never had a better ambassador. Ken Vinny, an inventor, a manufacturer of speed equipment from Wadsworth, Ohio, comes out of the alcohol funny car ranks and stepping up to race with the big boys. And it's far more expensive in this category, Brock. Kenny Bernstein estimates as much as $500 a run. And it could be that all that money starting to pay off for Bernstein because earlier Steve had an opportunity to talk to Kenny about how he's been running here. A very consistent weekend for you, Kenny. Something you haven't enjoyed this season. Now Ken Vinny stands in your way. Well, he's a good one. He runs good. He ran 91 yesterday, so consequently he can step up. He was a little slower last round than we were, but we weren't on course last round either, so he'll be a good race. You feel confident you can come up with another one of those low 90s, high 80s? Well, I think now we had a little problem then with number one cylinder dropping. Uh, Armstrong really leaned on it. If it'll run, it'll run 80 again, but that's the point. If it'll run, that's the question. So Kenny Bernstein comes to the line under the watchful eyes of veteran official starter Buster Couch. You see him there on the right side of your screen. A man that's seen probably more drag race starts than any 10 men on earth, Steve. And you'll notice Buster looking very carefully both these cars to make sure that there's no fluids leaking out of them that could lead to an accident. Ken Vinny in the near lane, out of the alcohol funny car ranks, has only been in the nitro category less than one year. Kenny Bernstein in the far lane. Vinny is away first, but he red lights. Ken Vinny leaves too soon. Kenny Bernstein blasts on through with a lapse time of 5.97. He maintains that consistency at 243 miles an hour. So as Kenny rolls to a stop, he will go into the second round and once again go under the watchful eyes of starter Buster Couch. Earlier, Steve had a chance to talk with this interesting man. 
After 21 years as NHRA's official starter, it's about time that somebody kidnapped Buster Couch and brought him down to the end of the track where it's a little quieter. Buster, your job entails a lot more than just pushing a button. Well, it does, Steve, but it's just something you learn over the years, you know. It just looks easy because I have a good crew, you know, and the racers understand we have our signals together, what we're doing, and it just looks like I stand there and push the button. Safety is your biggest concern up there. Yes, it is, and making sure the cars all properly i give them a visual inspection to make sure the guys the belts are fast and their helmets are fast and then you know the fire bottles have got the pins out of them and their extinguishers and things you have to give them a quick check because you know the drivers get excited and they forget these little things buster you've been known to tease these guys pretty good and occasionally they try to get back at you what are some of the funny things that have happened on the starting line i remember an incident with frank bradley i believe it was in california <laughs> yeah no he was in gainesville and they know i'm afraid of snakes and bugs i don't know why but i am and so he had a rubber snake and he was throwed it at me when he came by on a burnout and i like to run over about two or three people getting out of the way <laughs> but i fixed him up oh uh, i took a big it was about a five-gallon bucket of ice-cold water. It was real mushy with ice in it. And when he came up to make another qualifying run, I just dumped it in his lap. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the people that make this sport so spectacular, and Buster Couch is one of them. Stick around. We'll be back with more funny car action for Brainerd after this. We're back at Brainerd International Raceway for more fuel funny car competition in the NHRA North Star Nationals. The body about to be latched down on Roland Leon's Hawaiian car, driven by Mike Dunn. What a tenacious young man, Brock, to come back after an incredible crash uh, a few months ago in Columbus, Ohio at the Spring Nationals. Uh, lesser men would have quit. Boy, I guess, Steve, that was one of the most unbelievable crashes in racing history when uh, the old version of the Hawaiian came into that crash net at maybe 150 miles an hour, a ball of fire. Didn't look like Mike could even have a chance of surviving, and yet he walked away. What a pretty new car Roland has prepared here. This is a replica of sorts of a Dodge Charger. And he will be going against young Tim Gross as he does his burnout. Tim, a lot like Tom Anderson, unsponsored, a young, struggling race driver, trying his best, going against a heavily sponsored team of the Hawaiian. So is this sort of David and Goliath pair get ready to go? Let's go to the other end of the track with Steve Evans and Kenny Bernstein. Kenny Bernstein gets around a red light in Ken Vinny, but the elapsed time of 597 doesn't please you particularly. No, we're still off that uh, 110. We need 88, 87, I think, to, to really win. They're all in the nines. I guess it's hotter right now, and conditions aren't quite as good as they were yesterday, and uh, we're still just sneaking up on it. Uh, him red lighting bothered me a little bit. I thought I was late, and I watched him over there and got out of the groove, which didn't help. I, I really psyched me. <laughs> so you actually didn't know he had red lighted? Yeah, I did. When he left, I thought I was late, and then I looked and saw the tree, and that's when I really didn't go straight I think I really caused the ET to hurt a little because I got out of the groove I was watching him <laughs> I thought boy I'm late I'm in trouble <laughs> good luck next time it's a testimony to the technical progress of this sport that a guy like Kenny Bernstein can be disappointed with a time of 597 there was a day when nobody thought a six second drag race was even possible Steve well I tell you Brock who won't be disappointed with a 597 and that's the spirit car the 84 Corvette body machine of Tim Gross his wife Barbara backing him up and that's a, a very important part of the crew's work on the starting line to make sure that that car is sitting exactly in those hot sticky burnout tracks if you get out of the tracks the burnout uh, was a waste of money all right Steve as the Hawaiian does its second burnout Mike Dunn the driver is an interesting young man he's a second generation drag racer his father Jim Dunn a longtime competitor in this sport and a very good one Tim Gross is one of those guys, Brock, that literally lives hand to mouth as he tries to carve out a living in the sport of professional drag racing. He's been through his crashes, but maybe nothing like what we saw Mike Dunn endure at Columbus, Ohio, the Spring Nationals. Here is Dunn. The throttle sticks. The engine over revs and explodes suddenly into a ball of fire. Right now, Mike Dunn has absolutely no idea where he is on the racetrack. Suddenly, you'll notice the right rear slick literally explodes, ripping apart the body. Now, this is one of the shortest drag strips on the circuit. Mike Dunn has no parachute. It burned off in the fire. He just instinctively is trying to keep that car somewhere on the pavement. The idea with the net is to try to hit it head on. And fortunately for Mike Dunn, he accomplishes that as the body just melts. The fiberglass, red hot, almost transparent. No right tire, no brakes, and into the aircraft style catch nets. And incredibly enough, they do their job. The body is stripped off by the first net, the second net collects the 150-mile-an-hour out-of-control automobile. 
The most unbelievable part about this whole sequence is right now because you see Mike Dunn extracting himself from that destroyed race car and moving out of the fire and flame absolutely unhurt. Mike Dunn back now at the North Stars in perfect shape. Steve talked with him earlier. Well, Mike, you've uh, got the surprise of this event in round number two, Tim Gross. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely a surprise. He uh, ran real good qualifying, and he came back first round, repeated, and uh, ran a little quicker than us, so he's got lane choice. He's going to be tough. Well, this has been a new car for you folks after the accident in Columbus. You've sorted it out. It's just really starting to come around. Yeah, it's actually it's uh, been running a little bit better every week. We've been just uh, changing it, and it's been running real good. Uh, we got rid of our Japanese import after the crash. we got an American-built car now. It's working real well. <laughs> Brock Mike done uh, teasing a certain chassis builder in Southern California that built that car. They crashed at Columbus. Uh, apparently, Mike wasn't too fond of that machine. Look at Tim Gross's beautiful 84 Corvette. How does a guy with no budget at all have that kind of together act? It's amazing. It sure is a pretty car. Unfortunately, though, drag racing is not a beauty contest, and uh, Tim is up against the raw power of the Hawaiian. Tim Gross just overpowers the racetrack and for a moment there was in a little bit of trouble, but he wisely gets off the throttle, regains control, and looks at the back of Mike Dunn's parachute as he runs 5.99 seconds to go into round number two. Tim Gross out of this race early. A tough break for Tim, Steve, but yet another example that funny car racing is not just simply a question of stomping on the throttle. It takes an awful lot of finesse to maintain control over 2,500 horsepower. The next pair, Al Sagrini in that beautiful green new Firebird. This car started life once as a Firebird, although any relationship to uh, one you did buy in a showroom is pretty tenuous. That's a fiberglass shell over a tubular chassis carrying that monster supercharged engine. His competition will be Mark Oswald in the beautiful Candies and Hughes Firebird. But before they race, let's go to Steve. So Mike down with the helmet off. And Mike, they tell me that up in the starting line, you had a tremendous leave, a nice hole shot advantage going in. Well, I actually thought it was a little late. Uh, the car's just leaving uh, tremendously. It went out there and shook a little bit and got a little loose, and I pelled it once. And uh, did you hear what it ran? Uh, 590-something. Uh, are track conditions going to be important from here on? Is it going to start changing on us? I think they're going to start going away a little bit. So uh, it's going to be uh, kind of tricky here. We don't know whether we should detune it or leave it alone or what. You get into the clutch and the tires and all the things that uh, make them run. Yeah, there's definitely uh, all that we got to contend with, uh, but we'll figure something out. <laughs> Very articulate young man, Mike Dunn, but he may need a little bit more than a 599 to win the North Star National, Steve. You know, Brock, drag racing, especially in the funny car category, is a tremendous guessing game, and uh, Mike alluded to that. Al Sagrini, one of the better guessers, as he's won four NHRA national events. Sagrini from uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, a talented driver. This man, Mark Oswald, tabbed by car owner Candies and Hughes to wheel the first funny car that Candies has run uh, in a lot of years. They ran a top field dragster also with Oswald at the wheel and set the national record. Interestingly enough, they took that same engine, put it in the funny car, and have run the fastest speed ever. That is Paul Candies, the owner wisely getting out of the way. 256 miles an hour, the best clocking ever by a funny car, belongs to the Candies and Hughes camp. And there you see the Sagrini car backing up. Once again, these automobiles, as you said earlier, Steve, have taken awful lot of care and sensitivity in lining up. You might think that they just sort of back them up and drive down the drag strip, but it's a lot more complex than that, isn't it? Oh, you bet it is. And right now, Mark Oswald, I'm sure, is looking down at the engine temperature gauges to make sure that it's in that proper operating range. Paul Candies helping Mark in because the body is so low and the injector so high that until they get right up to the starting line, they have a hard time seeing those bottom lights on the Christmas tree. Paul Candies in the uh, tugboat and barge business in Homa, Louisiana. I'll tell you, it's a miracle that these guys can see anything out of these automobiles with that giant blower and uh, injector casing sticking up in front of them. And they sit way in the back of that bodywork, just about in the back seat if this was a real car. And they take a tremendous physical beating as well. This is a good race, but Mark Oswald, about 300 feet out, just moves away from Al Sagrini. Mark Oswald at 595, 248 miles an hour. He joins the rest in round two. Although I'm sure Mark may be looking to clean up his run the next time. He fishtailed a little bit about half track, but no matter. He does make the semifinals. The other pairing, Mike Dunn versus world champion Frank Hawley. And, of course, Mark Oswald will face Kenny Bernstein after disposing of Al Segrini. And now Steve Evans is with Mark at the other end of the track.
<laughs> Mark Oswald, you were worried about having crossed the center line? Yeah, it was about as close as you'd want to come. <laughs> Big top end speed, 248. Yeah, good. I think we stepped it up a little. We got a little lucky there. We had some changed some parts between rounds we didn't really want to. And we made a good guess on them, so it paid off. Been a long time since I've seen a closer semifinal. All of the cars have run mid 590s, all four of them in the semis. And it looks like that's what it takes anymore. <laughs> the lane choice is a, is a battle. It sure is. It's getting tough. The track's getting warmer all the time. It's going to be tough. Okay, good luck. Thank you, Steve. So we're going to see some hard racing from the funny cars. But before that, we'll be back with some top alcohol dragster action from the North Star Nationals. Stay with us. Back at Brainerd, Minnesota, I'm Brock Yates along with Steve Evans at Bruce down in Florida, bringing you more action from the North Star Nationals. And Steve, it's pro stock time. And a category the fans just love, Brock. These may look like street cars, they're required to, but under that skin is the most sophisticated race car in all of drag racing. And here's the man that owns the class, the two-time world champion from Arlington, Texas, Lee Shepard. He drives the rear and Morrison Camaro. And he's up against an up-and-coming young professional from Cayuga, Indiana, Don Coons. He drives a beautiful Pontiac Firebird. And Steve, all these cars run under very rigid rules. Minimum weight, 2,300 pounds, 500 cubic inch, normally aspirated engine, running on gasoline. Brock, these cars are so sophisticated in the suspension area, the chassis science, that they are the most expensive car to build in drag racing. Now let's watch Lee Shepard, the world champion here in the near lane, in the far lane, the challenger from Indiana, Don Coons, Chevrolet versus Firebird. They stage very carefully. The RPMs come up, and they are off with a bit of a hole shot. That's a surprise. Lee Shepard may have been a bit complacent at the starting line, but now he's nervous by less than a car length. The horsepower of Shepard wins it at 786 to a defeated 801. But what a start for Kuntz. The electronic reaction timer tells us that Don Kuntz was only two hundredths of a second away from a perfect light. That's Kuntz in the far lane. Lee Shepard was eleven hundredths of a second away from the light. He was light. So Shepard was operating with a seven hundredths handicap at this point on the racetrack. And only that famous rear and Morrison horsepower pulled it out for him. Brock is down at the far end with Lee Shepard, who had to be nervous at this point. Put a whole shot on you, huh? Did he surprise you? Uh, yeah, Don always gets a real good light. Uh, I was a little bit late that time, but I guess we're, uh, we had a little more power than he did. Got you at N86. You happy yeah. about that? Well, I think that's a little slow. I hope we can go a little faster than that. We'll probably have to to win this race. Okay, so uh, how's the racetrack hold it up? Well, it's about the same as it was first round. It might be a little bit slicker in places. But uh, hope, hopefully we can tune the suspension some for it. <laughs> okay, well, we'll let you get back to work. Thanks, Lee. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. The next race in the second round of Pro Stock will pit this man, five-time world champion Bob Glidden in the 83 Ford Thunderbird against the Chevrolet Camaro from Fairfield, Illinois. It is driven by David Hutchins, who was one of the winningest drivers ever in the sportsman class, but has found Pro Stock to be a good deal tougher. Bob and Etta Glidden, what a team they are from Whiteland, Indiana, full-time professionals who uh, many feel work harder at their craft than anybody in drag racing. Well, Steve, uh, like Kenny Bernstein, Bob Glidden's had kind of a dry spell recently. Yes, he has, but Ford has finally perfected their new aluminum motor, and look at it fly. After a perfect start, it is Bob Glidden at the far end with the wind, 7.90 seconds, 176 miles an hour. They waste no time getting the next pair fired and ready. Number three in the world, Warren Johnson in his Oldsmobile, doing the burnout pro stock style, not going over the starting line. The Oldsmobile does not have the aerodynamics of the Thunderbird or the Camaro, and it takes more horsepower to physically push it down the racetrack. Here you see the sleeker Camaro, driven by Joe Lapone of Malvern, Pennsylvania, the car owned by the famed Bill Jenkins, Mr. Chevrolet. Warren Johnson, who used to live right in this very area, has now moved down to Georgia, where uh, uh, more technology is available to him, and Warren is quite an innovator and has set the national speed record with this car. Joe Lapone in the far lane, a very alert, aggressive driver. Warren Johnson thinks more about the engine sometimes than his driving and can be late. It's a beautiful start by both of them. Warren Johnson and Joe Lapone. Joe Lapone was off the mark first, but Warren Johnson is there at 787 as Joe Lapone encounters some problems. But down at the far end, with no problems at all, is Bob Glidden, who's with Brock Yates. Bob, quick interview, second round. Uh... How was it? I think we made a little better run than we did the first round, but uh, we're going to have to step it up a little bit. Well, I think we run Shepard next, so 
They're uh, they're getting fast out there. Shepard ran an 86 last time, so uh, he figures he's got to step it up too. I uh, I think he ran a little quicker than we did. Well, congratulations anyway. We'll see you in the next round. Thank you much. Thanks, Mark. Pro Stock marches on, and in the near lane is Frank Iaconio from New Jersey. Frank has come so close to winning the world title on two separate occasions, but both times had to settle for the runner-up spot. Frank Iaconio, a terrific engine builder and a mighty good driver. His competition will be from Wayne, New Jersey, Don Campanella, who would be more than pleased with a couple of runner-up world championship finishes. He is in the far lane. So we've got a couple of neighbors here from northern New Jersey going up against each other. And of course, Frank Iaconio is the better known of the two, Steve. But it's Campanella who's away first. Campanella five hundredths of a second closer to a light. And here comes Iaconio, though. Frank Iaconio by a little more than a fender. Due to that hole shot on Campanella's part, it made the race a good deal closer than it might have been. 787, 176 miles an hour. Watch Campanella in the far line. You can see that car reacted first. Typical pro stock start with the wheels in the air. As soon as the car leaves, as soon as the driver can react, they grab and shift first gear. They'll shift two more times down the racetrack. In high gear, Iaconio has got to be wondering, where did Campanella come from? He's not supposed to be that close to me. Iaconio just squeaks it out. Frank, everybody seems to be running in the high 80s in this second round. Is that what you think it's going to take to win? Or everybody, a couple of guys say maybe you got to go a little quicker. Well, you know, maybe so, but the track seems to be getting worse, so I don't think you'll see any quicker times, you know. It's a, it seemed quite a bit worse the second round than it did the first round, and it was slow the first round. So. You make any chassis changes uh, for the third round in the, uh, to compensate for that slowness? Uh, no, we kind of did that after first round, you know, so there's really not too much left to do. Okay. Maybe a little bit, maybe loosen up the front end a little bit, but that's about it. Are you happy, basically happy with the second round? <sighs> no, because I think Warren uh, ran uh, quicker than I did. So I think he got lane choice, so if he did, I'm not too happy. Okay. Well, at least you got in the third round, so congratulations on that. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Frank, so intent, already thinking about that third round, and best that he should, because it's going to be tough. Lee Shepard will be up against the Ford of Bob Glidden. Frank Iaconio himself will be paired off with Warren Johnson in the Oldsmobile. If you like tire smoke and funny cars, stick with us. Back at the North Star Nationals, you look at the crowd here and you realize that drag racing has become one of the world's leading spectator motorsports, but it wasn't always that way. In fact, originally it was just a casual get-together of automotive enthusiasts, and Ed Bruce is right now down in Florida with a man who was there in the very beginning. It's my pleasure to be sitting here at Sunshine Drag Strip in St. Petersburg, Florida with one of the true, real legends of motorsports, and particularly drag racing, Art Malone. Art, uh, we see these these big fan facilities these days, like Brainerd. Uh, you walk through the pit area, you see all the 18 wheel rigs, the vans, the trucks, television, tape decks. What was it like when you started? Well, there wasn't no 18 wheelers. We finally uh, branched out and got us a, a, a suburban truck, but we started out with just a car, you know. In the trunk, we had a rock arm, maybe one piston, maybe one bearing, maybe one spark plug, and that was it. You know, it was it was kind of rough. We eat out of garbage cans and, uh, and stayed in uh, cheap motels. And How many days a week are we talking about on the road? Well, it wasn't uncommon to uh, leave Tampa and be gone for three or four months because we couldn't come back and forth, even though gasoline was 19 cents a gallon then and motels were $8 a night for the good ones. We still stayed on the road because we tried to plan our tours in, in the California area, you know, and catch tracks going out and tracks coming back, and three or four months wasn't uncommon. Sounds kind of like being on the road with a hillbilly man, I'm going to tell you. Uh, we're going to go back to Brainerd now, where it's a little bit easier getting there, but it's a little bit faster these days, too. Well, thanks, Ed. We're back with some very fast automobiles. Maybe not the fastest. They look like the AA fuel dragsters. They're basically the same automobiles, except for one thing. The engine, Steve, quite a bit different in terms of the fuel they burn. 
And Brock, that's why the category is called Top Alcohol Dragster. They're only allowed to run alcohol fuel. The correct name would be Menthanol. And to make sure that they do, that there's uh, no cheating going on, NHRA has a fuel check team down on the return road. And after every qualifying and every elimination win, they check to make sure that guys like Don Woosley of Winchester, Kentucky, have nothing but alcohol in that tank. His opponent here in uh, Top Alcohol Racing will be Ken Murray, one of the many Canadians involved in this category. He's from Winnipeg. Nitromethane, very expensive uh, in this country and even more so in Canada. So a lot of the Canadians stick to the alcohol classes. Well, they're very good classes for running on a budget, Steve. you got almost the same punch and power as you do out of the uh, nitromethane burning engines, but they're much more reliable. You can run lots longer with uh, less money on an alcohol car than you can with a fuel burner. Very true, Brock, but the initial investment in the engine and the chassis is about the same. In fact, maybe even a little more expensive for these guys because they use two transmissions. Uh, they're a three-speed automobile. They use uh, very expensive crankshafts to get a lot of cubic inches. They don't have the luxury of just pouring more nitro in the motor. They've got to do it with cylinder pressure. In fact, they're starting to find more breakage in this class uh, than they once did because leave it to the drag racers. Uh, they'll find the weak link. Just get them long enough. Well, it's competition at its best, and it just drives everything to the outer limits as we see these two automobiles stage. Woolsey, by the way, is one of the top runners in TAD, Steve. Yes, he is. Came out of the competition eliminator ranks, has held many, many records, and won a lot of divisional and national titles. And it's Woolsey away first. The Canadian red lights in the far lane, and Don Woolsey will pass him anyway and take the win. Murray in the far lane left the starting line too soon. He knew that Woosley was going to be tough and he had to gamble a bit, try to get a whole shot, but instead he left too soon and the Christmas tree bypassed the green and went right to red. He's out. And there's no recourse with the old red light, is there? Once it says goodbye, it is goodbye. Well, there's not a lot of second chances in this sport. If you cross the center line or the outside line, if you red light, uh, if you hold up the other driver too long in the starting line, these guys can invent ways to lose. <laughs> Boy, how about that? You're absolutely right. And most of it involves mental pressure. This is a mind game down here in the starting line. It's complicated enough as it is. But when you got some problems like Vic Anderson has, it really gets serious. Hard to tell what the problem is. In fact, I think Vic is trying to relate the problem to the crew. Has he lost fire? I believe he has. In fact, the truck is being pulled alongside. They're going to get the electric starter out of the back. Rarely do you get an opportunity to restart one of these cars. And rarely is it successful. I guarantee you right now that starter buster couch has looked at his watch, has marked the time to make sure that all of Anderson's problems here uh, don't handicap Bob Bussini, that his engine does not overheat on the starting line. That's not as big a problem with the alcohol fuel cars because they run so cool. He's got it, Brock. It's come back to life. But is he going to have time to do all the necessary burnouts? And will the engine be warm enough? Steve, is uh, there a special amount of time that they get, or is that a judgment call on the part of Buster? It is a judgment call, Brock, and on the part of Buster Couch, there is no appeal. All decisions are final. So Vic Anderson, a former top fuel racer now in the alcohol ranks, got a lucky break there. He did not consume too much time, got his engine relit. Remains to see how he does, though, against Bob Bussini, another Canadian from Winnipeg. As a matter of fact, a neighbor of Ken Murray's who went down in the first round against Don Wolseley. So, Anderson here in the near lane. A lucky break to be even present for the start. They stage, they're ready, the tree flashes. There's a red light in the far lane. The Canadian, Bob Bussini, has given this race to Vic Anderson. After all of Anderson's problems, he goes into round number two with a very good 6.64 lapse time at 206 miles an hour. He will right now try to take a big, deep breath. Boy, talk about Christmas morning. In the far lane, Bussini, you see him red light instantaneously. Anderson, of course, having trouble getting started and then winning the race on a red light. A very lucky boy. Steve Evans is with him at the far end of the racetrack. Boy, just when all looked darkest, huh? Oh, that was a bleak period, I tell you. <laughs> a scary moment. What happened back in the burnout area? Well, evidently there wasn't enough RPM and we were past the water and it just pulled the motor down enough to shut her off and we're lucky we got to restart it again. Did you see his red light up there? No. No, I didn't see that. <laughs> I didn't well, you see won that. it. You won it. Oh, great. After winning the points meet here a month ago, we had to come back and look good and this was great, I tell you. Maybe it's an omen for the rest of the day. Oh, let's hope so. Thank you kindly. You can bet there'll be more RPM second round, though. You betcha. <laughs> so Vic Anderson from just on the interstate in Minneapolis. Got to be a lot of hometown rooters for him in this giant crowd here at Brainerd. Stick around for more from the North Star Nationals. More 
our top alcohol drags to action coming your way from Brainerd, Minnesota and the NHRA North Star Nationals. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates and our friend Ed Bruce who's down in Florida. We'll be talking to him from time to time. And Brock, this is Daryl Gwynn, one of the brightest young stars in drag racing from Miami, Florida. He sure is, Steve. In fact, on the cowling of the car, if you look really closely, you can see it says the kid. And he is the kid in this league. A very, very fine young driver and a racing family. This boy probably went to his first drag race before he could walk or talk, as his father was a championship competitor and competition eliminator, and he's up against a former world champion, the pretty yellow car from Aurora, Colorado, a Brian Raymer. So Raymer has to adjust from an altitude of 5,000 feet at his home track in the Denver area down to virtually sea level here in Minnesota, but he's done it many times. The kid, Daryl Gwen, only 21 years of age, and uh, in his very first national competition, in fact, the U.S. Nationals went to the final round, and a lot of the pro car owners, Candies and Hughes being one of them, have said if uh, this kid's ever looking for a ride, have him see us first. You see a lot of different engines, Brock, in the top alcohol ranks, so that's one of the interesting qualities of this category. Brian Raymer has the Donovan engine at about 427 cubic inches. That was the first aluminum motor made specifically for drag racing. Daryl Gwynn, on the other hand, has that the second motor that uh, was invented for the application, the Keith Black power plant. Two very familiar names uh, in drag racing, Keith Black and Donovan. In all the stock classes, of course, you have to stay with the production blocks, but in the funny cars and the dragsters, you can use these specially fabricated blocks, most of which are built on the West Coast, Steve. Yes, they are, and it's nervous time now. As the RPMs come up, they are pre-staged. The top yellow lights are on. First to stage is Gwen. It is a dead even start. No advantage at the starting line. Raymer's front wheels finally settle down. Raymer, Raymer, no! Daryl Gwen in the last few feet of the racetrack comes around at 6.63 seconds to a losing 6.68, 205 miles an hour for the kid who goes into round two. Daryl Gwen backing down on the motor to aid him and stopping the car. I would imagine, Brock, that neither of these drivers knows who won. I mean, we could barely tell visually. Fortunately, the National Hot Rod Association. a guy with Raymer's talent out in front of you like that? Well, uh, I'm worried about the red light situation with the car. Uh, we're just trying to uh, not red light for the weekend. We fixed the chassis last weekend. We put a little bit more power in it for first round. I'm just trying not to red light. What do you mean the red light situation with the car? Well, we've had a problem with the front end lifting up and red lighting. It hasn't been me. And we think we got the problem solved. We've been at Garlitz's last week, and he fixed the car up for us, and we're really proud. So that uh, electronic beam doesn't know whether the wheels went forwards or straight up? Correct. Okay, go get him. Thank you. So a happy young man, Daryl Gwynn, one of the rising stars in all kinds of drag racing. Who's to know where his future will take him in this sport? Okay, more top alcohol dragster action. Dennis Forsell from Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of the really big names in this sport. He's going up against yet another man from Winnipeg, Canada. David Fedorovich. And Brock Fedorovich is a new name to national event competition. Uh, what is this, the third car we've seen from Winnipeg? That has got to be the hotbed of Canadian alcohol drags to raise it. It sure is. And of course, uh, we saw uh, another pair, uh, Vic Anderson from Minneapolis, square off against Bob Bassini from Winnipeg. Anderson won that one. Let's see if the Canadians can come back. So far, they're uh, zero for two. So there's a lot of Canadian fans in the stands who'll be rooting for this guy, David Fedorowicz. He's the last of the Maple Leaf contingent to alive in top alcohol dragster competition. He's facing a tough, tough man in Dennis Forsell, one of the big names in this kind of racing, along with Darrell Gwynn and Don Wolseley, both of whom have won. Interesting set of exhaust headers on Forsell's car, Brock. They look like they came off of a funny car. When again we see uh, Fedorowicz's car, you'll notice his are the Zumi style that points straight up to actually put force down on the tires for more traction. But uh, Forsell feels maybe those slow you down a bit. The wing is up there for that same function. So he's using a, a totally different type of exhaust system. Here you can see the contrast. And that's the neat thing about drag racing.
classic hot rodding. And speaking of hot rodding, that's Steve Gibbs, the competition director of the National Hot Rod Association, going out there to uh, get rid of a little garbage before the next race, Steve. Oh, I'll tell you, he's one of the best executives in motor racing. First, a free stage is a Canadian on the far side. You see the top yellow light is on in his line. That's just to help them get lined up. In comes Dennis Forcell in the near line. The Spindley front tires breaking those electronic mains. When they get staged, the RPMs will come up to probably 8,000, maybe more, and they are off. And with a good advantage at the start is a Canadian, but he's now falling behind. He could not parlay that whole shot into a win. It is Dennis Forcell from behind with a 6.63. You look at that elapsed time and the others we've seen in this round, it gives you some idea how competitive the semi-final round is going to be. These could be races of milliseconds. The turnaround crew directing Dennis Forcell off of the racetrack. When we do see that semi-final round, it'll be the kid, Darrell Gwynn from Miami versus Kentucky's Don Woosley. And it'll be Dennis Forcell from Minnesota up against Vic Anderson. Brock Yates is at the end of the track with Dennis Forcell. Dennis, we got you as a winner, but you don't seem very happy. What, you got some problems with the car? Well, it just uh, felt a little lazy up on the big end. You didn't hear what the mile an hour was, did you? No, I didn't. Uh, I think we got you at a 63, if I'm not sure. Well, the field's close, nicely bunched. <laughs> We're all right in there at 60s. But you think you could use uh, some more top end, huh? Yeah, I think the car's laying down about mid-track. Mid so you got to get some more uh, top end before next somewhere. round. All right. <laughs> well, good first. Pass the first round anyway. Yeah, right. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Well, NHRA may need that computer to call the winners in that semifinal round. They're that tightly bunched. Let's again go to Ed Bruce in Florida. Back at Sunshine Drag Strip in St. Petersburg, Florida with Art Malone. Art, uh, when you got started, what made you and, and your crew unique in the business? Well, we were the first touring professionals. There were guys that would go to events across the country for one event, but we stayed on the road for months. And at the time, we didn't even know we were touring professionals. Uh, we just finally figured it out after we'd been on the road about six months and making a heck of a living. We decided that we were touring professionals in the very first. Now, you've been involved in motorsports for how many years? Uh, since 1954 is when okay, I... Okay, but you didn't really start in drag strips, right? And it was kind of an accident that uh, got you into drags. Really, it was. Uh, I was a oval track stock car racer and got involved with Don Garlis driving his car. And, uh, of course, we started touring around and making money and uh, getting our pictures taken and signing autographs and I was an overnight hero and of course everybody likes that you know the money and the hero part well, I couldn't give it up. Did you foresee in those days uh, 250 miles an hour uh, five and six second ETs? No, no in fact the matter I mean uh, 200 miles an hour would, would have been just awesome. We, we thought we was up against a wall we didn't realize that they would have tires three times as wide and uh, all these exotic fuel injections and great big mammoth floors and all this crazy stuff, you know, and transmissions. We was all direct drive, and you didn't have the good strip conditions, uh, the blowers and the traction compounds and the concrete launch pads and all that, you know. I mean, we just run on, on a piece of pavement that was dirty, and uh, we didn't have the, uh, the good clutches and the, and the good pieces. It was just a man in there uh, letting the clutch out halfway and hanging on the brake and uh, doing what you could to get it down through there. Let's go back to Brainerd and uh, see some 250s and some five and six seconds, okay? Ed, we'll be back to see the modern day touring professionals and drag racing in just a moment. Well, a very confused Larry Miner who has just beaten his teammate at an incredibly low speed, Steve. Well, Brock, we'll talk about that later when the second round of Top Fuel comes about. Right now, it's time for the real crowd pleasers in drag racing, funny cars. An unfortunate name, really, for $50,000 automobiles that run times almost as quick as the top fuel racers. Actually, these are alcohol funny cars. They're restricted to alcohol in the tank. And the first pairing here in round one finds from Sacramento, California, Bill Barney versus the pretty yellow car in the far lane, Gary Southern of Glendora, California. This is Gary Southern. He is a tree surgeon by occupation. Someday I knew I would meet a tree surgeon. His competitor here in the first round is a surprise entry, Bill Barney of Sacramento, California, who seldom ventures out of the northern part of the Golden State. Barney is driving an 83 Dodge Charger, actually a replica of one. These are fiberglass bodies. The cars weigh about 1,850 pounds. They use a three-speed transmission. It's uh, simply a matter of pushing a button to shift it. And even though these cars go in a straight line, they are very, very difficult to drive. And Steve, aside from that kind of softer exhaust note uh, of these automobiles from a distance, they look exactly like the nitro-burning uh, funny cars that we all know so well. 
Well, Brock, they are indeed uh, almost a carbon copy. The biggest difference is, of course, uh, the fluid in the tank. It is alcohol or menthol, the technically correct term. And they are checked to make sure there are no additives in that fuel every time they make a run by uh, NHRA's chemist down at the far end of the racetrack. And the vehicles are therefore a lot more reliable, I think, than the uh, than the big cars, right? Well, that was true at one time, but uh, give a racer anything and he'll figure out how to break it. They are making so much cylinder pressure inside these motors, they are starting to blow superchargers and crankshafts out the bottom. Uh, they'll find the weak link, believe me. So does Gary Southern in the far lane, the Captain Crazy car. In the opposite lane is Bill Barney, and Southern is away first, but Southern red lights. Southern has left a foul start red light on the Christmas tree. He is automatically disqualified. And when you look at the time of Barney at 6.66 seconds, that is very quick. And you can understand why Southern may have gambled on the starting line and lost. Well, Gary may be out of competition, but he still leads the points towards the world championship. Tire smoking, alcohol funny cars. In the near lane, a very competitive racer that is Fred Mandolini of Schiller Park, Illinois. His competition is a car that uh, I have never seen before, actually, until we came here to Brainerd. Daryl Amberson of OCL, Minnesota. An unknown quantity, really. Not so with Fred Mandolini, who's won repeatedly in the alcohol funny car ranks as one of the most feared drivers. And now let's go to Steve Evans with Bill Barney. So Bill Barney driving the Jack Halsey car and a beautiful alcohol funny car it is from Sacramento, California. Gets through round number one. A bit of a gift up there from Gary. <laughs> what was that? I'm sorry. He red lighted up there. Oh, I figured he did when he was gone pretty early there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've heard something. We're going to have to get back right with it. So I'm, we're not really sure what we ran or anything right now, but I know it hurt it in, in that run. Alcohol funny because usually pretty dependable. Yeah, I'm not really sure what happened right then, but it popped a little bit. So we've got to get with it. <laughs> well, Steve Evans said earlier that they were trying to figure out how to break unbreakable uh, alcohol funny cars, and it appears that Bill Barney may be on his way. In the meantime, let's go back to the race with Fred Mandolini and... Daryl Amberson. Steve, should be an interesting race because, as you said earlier, we don't know anything about Amberson as far as his abilities to compete with a veteran like Bandolini. One thing we do know, Brock, if NHRA licenses this driver, he is competent and safe to be on this racetrack. Mandolini is known for cutting a very good light. Excellent reaction times on the starting line. They move into the electronic beams. Daryl Amberson is in there first, but Fred Mandolini is off the mark first. This is all Mandolini, as expected. Fred Mandolini from Illinois with a 6.60, 206 miles an hour. He advances to the semifinals. A solid run by an acknowledged former champion. And we'll be back with more top alcohol funny car action from Brainerd, Minnesota after these messages. Stay with us. Over the years, Major League drag racing has become a very complicated and a very technical sport. Steve Evans is with a man who makes sure those complicated rules are enforced. Superstar rookie, it doesn't matter to NHRA tech inspectors like Chuck Nelson. Their job is to make sure these cars are safe and get a thorough going over at every NHRA national event. And Chuck is going to demonstrate that process using Gary Southern's Captain Crazy car from Southern California. And Chuck, where do you start? What's the first? See, the first thing that we check is the driver's credentials. We check uh, the NHRA competition license and their uh, SFI card, which uh, tells us that the chassis has been inspected within this past year. So Gary's license is up to date. Gary, by the way, has driven everything imaginable. What's next? From there, we uh, do uh, record the SFI card, as I say, to uh, justify the uh, certification the past year. From there, we go into the actual inspection of the car. We began at the uh, front suspension to check for the uh, lock nuts, uh, cotter keys, and so forth to be sure that the suspension is mounted correctly to the car and there's no excessive wire. Okay, what's next? From that standpoint, we move further on back. We check the uh, one of the very important items is the fuel shut uh, shutoff system, which uh, the driver can activate from the driver's compartment. This controls the fuel will actually go into the engine. From there, we go on back to the uh, supercharger blower restraints, these items here that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. the this black keeps strap. the supercharger on in case it pops yes, back. In case that the engine does lean out and it has a blower explosion, instead of it p being pitched into the stands, we uh, encounter these items to keep the actual supercharger and injector on the engine. Okay, what's that? Steve, from the engine uh, compartment, we go into the driver's area. One of the most prominent uh, safety items is the bell housing shield for the clutch and flywheel. You can see we require a special number of uh, bolts and studs to mount the uh, bell 
bell housing to the engine. Here we have the clutch inspection cover, again, which is uh, attached to the housing with a, a good number of grade eight uh, uh, bolts. Back from there, we go into the actual transmission, which uh, takes the power of the engine to the wheels. This is the uh, Linco type that the driver will shift a couple of times. These are the shift levers. The uh, transmission is protected, or the driver's protected from the transmission with a special ballistic uh, blanket. From that item, we move on further back to the actual driver protection in the uh, shoulder harness, seat belt, and what we call the crotch strap. These, all these items, as you can see, are wrapped with uh, special protection uh, in case of fire to where they won't burn away. They will still retain the driver into the car. It's important that all these be in good shape. Oh, very much so, yes. Uh, sometimes these items have to be changed as much as three or four times a year, depending on the weather that the car actually gets. Okay, what we got here? From there, we're going to the actual driver's compartment. It doesn't uh, seem to be very much there, but of course, uh, we do have to protect him in case of, uh, of upset from his helmet striking the bars from, from concussion in that area. That's what this padding here is for. And of course, the uh, frame uh, and the rest of the cage protects him in case of upset. Okay. From there, we're going back to the fire extinguisher system, which we require to have about uh, 20 pounds of special uh, uh, Freon mix that goes into these extinguisher systems. Uh, about 15 pounds on the uh, on the engine and compartment and five pounds on the driver. And the brakes? Uh, the brakes are very, very important. Of course, they only have them on the rear, and they're the special spot disc brakes, in addition to the parachute that the driver uh, uses with the car. And what about the body of one of these cars? Well, the body's very complex. Uh, let's st step over and take a look at it. It's made out of fiberglass. It's all made out of fiberglass, as you can see. Trimmed, uh, of course, in aluminum to give it strength in extra areas. It also has the, uh, I don't know where you can see it back in there, but the items that protect uh, the driver against the fire coming back in the driver's compartment. So you have to have a seal uh, for the body to the chassis? Yeah, it actually seals the engine out of the driver's area, in other words, uh, for the fire system to, uh, to work properly. You've even got windows in the firewall? Exactly, yes. That lets the driver see it the first notice as whether they've got a problem or not. From there, we make a measurement across the front axle of the car to be sure that the body is wide enough. Other than that, uh, there's no other measurements we make on the actual body itself. Do you expect the driver's gear as well? Oh yes, very much so. This is the most important part. I see he has one of the new helmets here with the double visors on there. Uh -huh. uh, this particular item has got the sock that fits over the driver's head. It uh, has a number of layers within the fire suit. I don't know whether we can see it too well here or not. The fire suit itself is extremely thick. Five layers? Yes, at least, yes. And they're all identified. Oh, yeah, the boots, along with the gloves, are all the same uh, system, five or six layers of the Nomex material. Fits very snugly and very hot, I might add, even before he gets in there to drive the car. It's worth it, though, for the protection. Oh, he's got to have it. He's got to have it. There's no doubt about that. Well, if somebody warms up one of these funny cars nearby, we'll let Chuck continue his inspection of Gary's driving gear. And really, this was just a demonstration of the process. It's far more thorough and rigorous than even we showed you here right now. Okay, Steve, and let's go back to the starting line where we're going to see some of the most interesting and colorful automobiles at Brainerd. The competition eliminators. Boy, anything, you name it, you race it. For example, uh, this little machine started life in 1923 as a Model T Ford. But uh, Mick Stanley of Winnipeg, Manitoba has done a whole lot to, in fact, about all that's left right now is a radiator shell, Steve. Uh, big V8 stuffed in it and uh, all kinds of modifications done to the chassis, the, the brakes, the transmission, the roll cage, everything is different. And Brock, under NHRA's unique handicap system, Mick Stanley of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada is going to have to be a patient man. David Nickens of Houston, Texas and the 83 Firebird will leave the starting line first. Mick Stanley will have to wait for a few more lights and then try to catch him. It's all based on what they call the indexes. NHRA's computer assigns an index to every class in sportsman racing. It's what a well-prepared, well-built, well-driven car should run. Some can run quicker than that. Some can't even get close to it. In the case of both of these guys, they can run under that index. You take the index for the two classes, subtract it. The difference is dialed into the Christmas tree. In this case, the head start goes to the 83 Firebird from Houston, and he takes full advantage of it. Nickens with a good light, a good reaction time. Here comes the 23T Roadster, but not in time. David Nickens wins it at 8.89 seconds, 151 miles an hour. I would guess that Stanley had some problems, Brock. He should have been much closer than he was. Well, it sure didn't turn out to be much of a race, unfortunately, for uh, Mick Stanley. But here's a couple of other really interesting automobiles. Boy, as we said earlier, you name it, you got it in Competition Eliminator. This is a pure little dragster. This particular automobile is run by Gary Wetzel at Kiwana, Indiana. 
the Chevrolet powered automobile uh, going up against him. Danny Townsend from Muncie Indiana and a 32 Austin and he is a big gun in this class Steve. This again will be a handicap start. The winner will face off with David Nickens when we get to the competition eliminator final. Gary Wenzel utilizes a small block Chevrolet with a single four barrel carburetor and that's all you can use in the Charlie economy dragster class. He's up against the A altered. That's a big block Chevrolet fuel injected of Danny Townsend and the altered Roadster is the quicker of the two cars as far as that index again is concerned and he will have to be the patient man. He will have to wait. The dragster will get the head start. Gone is the dragster of Gary Wenzel. Here comes Danny Townsend. He's got a lot more horsepower, a lot more cubic inches. Oh, I couldn't call it. The electronic finish line judge, though, says it's Gary Wenzel at 8.44 seconds. That's what handicap racing is all about. Just hair raising finishes. Well, you can sure credit the computer with uh, coming up with the right kind of handicap on this one, Steve. They speed than that one. So Gary Wenzel goes back to the pits to get ready for his final round against David Nickens in the competition eliminator final. So stay with us from Brainerd, Minnesota and the North Star Nationals. We'll be back. Usually here in the land of sky blue waters, hunting and fishing is the favorite pastime. Today it's championship NHRA drag racing. We're at the North Star Nationals and just about ready for top fuel eliminator. But first, let's go back down to Florida with Ed Bruce for some drag racing nostalgia. He's with Art Malone, one of the most famous drivers of all time. Back at Sunshine Raceway in St. Petersburg, Florida with Art Malone. Art, uh, earlier we were talking about when you first started in drag racing and how it came about when, when Don Garlitz was injured. And uh, there were some pretty important things that happened to you right off the bat, weren't there? Yes, uh, Ed. Uh, actually, I started here in Tampa stock car racing, and uh, when Don got burned, I started driving for him. And our first event that we ran in Sanford, Maine, I set a world's record and went from there to uh, Great Bend, Kansas, and set the other end of the world's record, which was the lap's time and the mile per hour. And uh, we started making more money suddenly than I had ever made in my life, and uh, I converted to a drag racer real quick and, uh, of course, uh, quickly became a top fuel addict and uh, have been since and still am kind of an overnight success exactly exactly i mean i was i was a uh, 90 dollar a week employee and suddenly we was making thousands of dollars so what were you doing at the time i was working right here in the st pete area uh, as a, a general contractor making about 90 dollars a week and needless to say the thousands of dollars we started making with top fuel really impressed me you didn't really want to go back to general contracting no sir i never did okay let's go back to brainerd minnesota right now for some more drag racing action all right, thank you, Ed Bruce. This is Doug Gerhulis from Bakersfield, California. If he can get a win here, he will make his first ever NHRA championship final round. His competition, uh, a reluctant winner in the first round, you'll remember, Larry Miner of San Jacinto, California, the world's largest potato farmer. And both guys, Steve, really are kind of lucky to be here in their own way. Uh, they're fine racers, but uh, remember Doug Gerhulis had a single run when Jody Smart's engine broke at the line. And then the same thing happened to Larry Miner's teammate, Gary Beck, when Beck couldn't start and Larry Miner made a pass alone. So they're here uh, based on, in a sense, the largesse of a couple of other guys. And Larry Miner, this is his first year as a top fuel driver. He, you mentioned off-road earlier, he has won the Baja 1000, but today he's concerned with only 1,320 feet. Well, he's turned out to be a very fine driver in drag racing. He's used to handling big horsepower automobiles. That's been his uh, stock and trade for a long time. But to climb into an automobile that produces over 3,000 horsepower, as one of these do, takes an enormous amount of finesse. He's only been doing it for a short time. But, of course, he's had a great teacher in Gary Beck. Earlier, Steve had a chance to talk to Larry about his impending race with Doug Kerhulis. A lot of drivers race their entire career and never win one NHRA national event. Larry Miner has already 
won one in his rookie season of driving. He's got a chance today to win two. You got another advantage, actually. You got the quickest car in the world sitting over there, Gary Beck's machine. Would you take any parts off of that car? Maybe the tires Gary told us about? We didn't change anything for this round. Uh, Kahulis hasn't been running that good, and we think our car can run better right now. If we get into the finals, uh, we're probably going to take the engine and tires out of Gary's car and put them in mine. The chassis are very similar? The chassis are identical. The motor plates exchange, uh, everything is the same. Okay, uh, you need to get a little pumped up here. I know you kind of wanted uh, Gary to win, but now it's, uh, it's up to you to carry that blue banner. Well, I, I think we can, you know, I'll get pumped up when I'm in the car. I'm down right now. I like to, I like to sit off to myself and uh, try to think the thing out, see what I should do different. Well, there are those who will tell you that the so-called Gary and Larry show is a bit of overkill with these two incredibly fast automobiles and a very heavily financed team, especially when they go up against a, a clear underdog like Doug Kerhulis. But Doug's uh, run very well on occasion, Steve, and can't be counted out in this race. I would tell you what, Brock, if adrenaline was horsepower, Doug Kerhulis would go 600 miles an hour. He gets more pumped up before a drag race than anyone I know. And quite frankly, Larry Minor, as you can see in that interview before the race, is down. I wonder if he's ready for this confrontation. Well, I don't think he was mentally prepared for it. I think he probably thought that if there was anybody from the minor team in the uh, this round of competition, it would be uh, his teammate, Gary Beck. I will tell you, he left right with Dr. Hullis, but shuts the car up. It is Doug Kerhulis in his first ever final, 5.86 seconds, 243 miles an hour, which sounds fast, but is really pretty slow for a top field dragster. Might be something wrong with that car. Well, there certainly was something wrong with Larry Miner's car. He shot it down at half track. And let's go right now to the next pair of competition in top field dragster. And we saw him before Joe Amato and... Who could forget this pink car? Oh, the three-time world champion. In fact, no driver has ever won the top fuel title even twice. And very few people in life uh, are known simply by their first name. But if you say Shirley to any motor racing fan in the world, they know exactly who you're talking about. Joe Amato, so impressive in only his sophomore season as a top fuel driver, and he loves to race Shirley Muldowney. Right now, a guy who's got to be pumped up is Dr. Hulis, and Brock Yates is with him. All right, Doug. How's it feel? First time, final round. It's it's there, right on the threshold. I'm telling you, this is a first of all, we got to get first round. And I mean, I stepped on this thing so hard that it scared the Pope. I'm telling you. I think we're okay. I'm just glad to be in the final. It helps a lot. Car run good. It wasn't too bad. What did this thing run? 586, 243 miles an hour. Not bad, huh? You take mean, it, huh? It went just better than 1370s, the way I look at it, you know? So we got a chance to do good. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you very okay, much. Doug. Okay, Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Krahulis referring to his 13-second shutoff run in the first round. Well, I'll tell you, Doug Krahulis uh, marches to the beat of a different drummer. He and Shirley Muldowney are very good friends, and I'm sure that if he had his choice of these two, he would rather race Shirley in that final round just because they'd have more fun. Joe Amato so impressive, though, in only his sophomore season as a top fuel driver. Well, I'm sure that Shirley will race Joe Amato like she races everybody else. She's almost machine-like at the line. But for Joe Amato, I think there may be a special motivation for him racing against the world champion. Joe Amato has a very special reason for wanting to beat Shirley Muldowney here in round two, right? If I don't win this race, I'm probably not going to be able to go home because my mother-in-law always watches TV and sees Shirley Muldowney beating this guy. And she always says, what am I? She's an old Italian lady, 72 years old, and she's always saying, what, what, does, what does she be doing beating you guys? She should be home in the kitchen cooking. And, you know, and, she's, all, and she's always on TV, and she wins and beats all the guys, and, and we're always coming home. And every time I call home and ask about the race, she says, and she met Shirley, and she liked Shirley at California last year. She always asks, how's Shirley doing? And she says, was Shirley there? Did you beat Shirley? I mean, that's like, you know, if I call her and tell her she beat me, she can tell me to stay here. And I go home so i've got to do it just for her well i tell you if she had some of shirley's lasagna she'd be proud of that little italian girl too oh i'm sure she's a good cook you know it's, just, it's, it's something i've got to do hopefully i can do it <laughs> well i'm sure the only thing uh, shirley's thinking about cooking right now is joe amato's goose uh, steve uh, because uh, he's up against a lady that just doesn't psych out on the line and many people say she's the finest natural driver in big time drag racing well, you know, it's interesting. I've asked Shirley that question, and she thinks Gary Beck is. But I'd have to agree with you, Brock, especially right off the starting line. 
Shirley Modani's car running better than it has since early in the season when she won the Winter Nationals. Shirley is away first. Amato smokes the tires. That could hurt him. They are side by side. It is Joe Amato. Shirley's car goes sideways on the light. She recovers quickly. Joe Amato wins it at 571. Shirley a little late with the shoot, but this is a long racetrack, and Jerry Amato is one happy lady. Well, they travel everywhere together. They're a very close couple, and she just cheers her husband as hard as anybody ever has cheered a drag racer. She's delighted, Steve. And it was. Out of the car, he doesn't know who won. You won. Oh my mother in law, that one was for boy. That was a close race, Steve. I think I was ahead of her most of the track, but she started to make a little move on me on the other end, and that boy had to be real close. that would be interesting to see that on TV. She what left on you just a little bit. I didn't well, hear the time. I figured she was going to do that because she has a clutch pedal, and we have a crower glide, and that's worth a couple hundreds. We tried to tune the car up enough just to have that little advantage, and apparently we did it just enough. What do we run? I didn't hear the elapsed time, but I do know one thing. You've got Doug Kerhulis in the final. Oh, well, this is the fourth race in row. We're in the final. I can't believe it. What a year. <laughs> <laughs> a very pleased drag racer. Not so Shirley Muldowney, Brock's with her. Looked like uh, you almost had him in the light. I had him all the way until the car, it burned one about, about 1,200 feet, and I felt it nosedive, so. It looked like, it looked like from way up here that maybe you got a little bit sideways uh, as you got in the lights. That so? No. No, not, no, I, it, that was after the lights. Okay. I kind of just, uh, she was moving pretty fast. A lot, of, a lot of top end, the famous Muldowney top end, but it just came a little bit late, huh? Yeah, well, uh, when you've got seven pistons, okay, and not eight, that, yeah. that was the that difference hurts. right yeah. there, yes. Well, fantastic race. I'm sure a bunch of people sitting back there got well, their we, money's worth anyway. Yeah, I think everybody did. I'm glad to see that they, the fans will get their money's worth in the final. They'll see two cars actually race down the race course. Yeah, <laughs> surprise. Okay, Shirley Muldowney. A little reference to the uh, earlier action this afternoon. Shirley, apparently not a big fan of the two blue cars of Larry Miner, but in the top fuel final, a couple of underdogs make good. Joe Amato will race Doug Kerhulis. We'll be back in Brainerd right after this. We don't have to tell you this is one of the greatest vacation areas in North America. Just look at that giant crowd spread around the racetrack here at Brainerd, Minnesota for more North Star Nationals action. As Frank Holly's funny car, its lid still up, gets pulled out for the semifinal, Steve. What a season this has been for Frank Holly and the Chi-Town Hustler. Uh, they began as they ended last year, winning races. And Brock had a chance earlier, uh, when all was a little bit calmer, to talk to Frank. Frank Lane Choice made one yet? Yeah, I think we're going to stay in the left. We started out today preferring the right, but we never run there. We've made two runs in the left. The car is working fine, and I don't think there's that much of a difference in the lane, so I'm looking for a real close drag race in the semifinal. Not tampering with fate lane-wise, huh? Oh, no. Uh, we've, I, I learned a long time ago that to don't mess with stuff, and that's why this car has won a lot of drag races. Well, the talking is over. Frank Holly adjusting his gloves, getting comfortable in the Chi-Town Hustler. That engine is coming to life right now as Austin Coyle primes it with a little gasoline. To keep it running, the electric starter comes off, and now it's all up to Frank. Nothing more the crew can do. It's in the young Canadian's hands. They won four races this season so far, starting off with the Winter Nationals, the Gator Nationals in Florida, the Mile High Nationals. It goes on and on for a car that was totally unsponsored and still is, for that matter. But here's the competition. A very hungry Mike Dunn and Roland Leong's car. They've had uh, a disastrous season, as we showed you earlier, destroying that car in a fiery net collision. But Mike now got a taste of victory. He defeated Paul Smith in round number one. You'll recall he got to Tim Gross in round two to earn the semifinal round berth. But here is where the shy towns consistency usually starts to work for them. When everybody else starts making changes, guessing on the clutch of the fuel, Austin and Frank Holly just do the same thing they always do. If there's a car on the ground that can run 570, they don't worry about that. They'll go out and run their 595 and try to outlast everybody. But the Hawaiian, on the other hand, has a history of about this point in the race smoking the tires, and that can be due to track conditions. Brock, talked to Mike about that. Mike, uh, looks like the weather's changing rather radically, getting a lot more humid, maybe a little hotter. Uh, some of the guys are talking about the racetrack getting a lot slicker. Have you made any changes? Yeah, we, uh, we've actually hopped ours up just a little bit. It's been way off you know, all day, just run real easy, and uh, has been able to run the middle of the track so we hopped her up a little bit but not as much as we think it needs to make it the most amount of power in hopes that the track will go a little way away a little bit and we'll be pretty close well you've heard from both drivers Frank Holly said they didn't change a thing Mike Dunn says we hopped it up a bit remains to be seen which guessed right well Rock. Steve you can hop these things up in a couple of ways of course by increasing the level or percentage of nitro 
and also by uh, fooling with the boost pressures on the supercharger. And another way too uh, is to tighten up the clutch and that is the mistake uh, some people feel the Hawaiian often makes that they try to overpower the racetrack with the clutch. In other words get a quick elapsed time because of the clutch and not so much horsepower. The Hawaiian being moved into position by car owner Roland Leong who started his racing on the island of Oahu a few years back. Mike Dunn carrying more fire protection uh, like all these funny car drivers than any other kind of competitor, Steve. Oh, and they need it. Here is the Chi-Town Hustler, the world champion, moving in the far lane. They take about three G-forces off that starting line. It was a beautiful lead, but instantly Frank Holly puts a few car lights on Mike Dunn. So Frank Holly, there's that consistency. 595, almost like they dial it in. 241 miles an hour. Holly goes into the final round of the North Star Nationals. And he knows his competition will be one of these two men, Mark Oswald or Kenny Bernstein, as one of the candies. And Hughes Truman fires up that big supercharged Hemi engine in his car. Bernstein's fired up already, getting ready to move into line, Steve. Brock, I think if you were to ask Kenny to summarize the season to this point, he'd tell you it was research and development. They have not won that many races, but they are making progress. Dale Armstrong and this crew are innovators. They're not trying to just get into the show. They're trying to win them all. He got a little taste of victory at an independent race last week in Salt Lake City. Comes into this race confident. Kenny just drives the car. He lets Dale and the guys worry about making it go quick and go fast. Brock spoke to Kenny just before he climbed into the car. Any thoughts before the semis, Kenny? Well, we got to run better than we have the first two runs, I think. Uh, Candies and Hughes ran a little quicker than we did the last time. Uh, we need to get back in those 80s again that we had yesterday. Yeah, it's getting humid. Uh, you got any, made any changes at all as far as um, uh, fuel is concerned for the... Not so much in the fuel area, a little touch there, but not much. Gave it a little bit more blower this time because the area is going away, like you mentioned. But uh, it'll have a little horsepower. I hope it'll run. Okay, good luck, Kenny. Brock also got the pre-race thoughts of Oswald's car owner, Paul Candies. I'm a Paul Candice on the line. Paul, you were very late coming up here. Were you just psyching people out or did you have some problems? No, we had a little problem. We went back there first round and we got lost. We got behind ourselves. We had to change it. Bloor went bad and we had to change it. And there's more things than we normally change. And uh, we're just 10 minutes behind our normal schedule. So <laughs> we had some people like excited. And everybody's a little excited. We knew we were going to be here. You're going to be okay. You bet. Everything will be fine. Okay, thanks, Paul. Well, that's what he thought then. The smile has now disappeared from Paul Candice's face. There is trouble with that car. Tom Cattleman, one of the crewmen, Leonard Hughes, co-owner of the car, in there with some tools, trying to fix whatever the problem is. It may be a leak. Leonard Hughes disgustingly throws his wrench away. Cattleman is not going to give up, though. He is still in there trying to repair whatever the problem is. The engine is still running. You can see the blower belt and pulleys going around. Leonard throws in the towel. Leonard Hughes shuts the engine down. It is all over for Mark Oswald. What a tough break. It had to be a very simple thing. Probably an oil line coupling of some kind that started a leak, Steve. Kenny Bernstein backing up. He does not yet know that he has a gift here into the final round. He sure doesn't, Steve, as Mark Oswald unlimbers himself from that race car. A very disappointed young man. You know, they get so much adrenaline built up for this five, six seconds of uh, competition. It's, uh, it's incredible the letdown that they get when suddenly something breaks like that. The crew goes through it as well, Brock. Janie Oswald in tears, so disappointed that they didn't even have a chance to go to the starting line and race. You know, that makes it doubly tough, but he didn't get a shot at it even. Yeah, well, everybody gets on an emotional high, and you get out there, and there's a crowd around, and that other car's running, and poor Mark Oswald uh, takes his helmet off. He uh, never even uh, tasted battle in this particular uh, semifinal here, as Kenny Bernstein will get himself what we call a single. I wonder whether he's going to run as hard as he can. One thinks he probably will simply because he's going to look for lane choice. In this particular instance, if he runs quicker than Holly did, he will get the lane choice. So you can be sure that Kenny Bernstein, regardless of the competition, is going to stomp on the throttle all the way down a quarter mile. And he's got himself a good, clean run. No problems. 597, 243 miles an hour. But the 595 of Frank Holly is quicker. That gives Frank the lane choice. Kenny, not quite quick enough. Of course, for this young man, not even a chance to go quick enough. Mark Oswald, disappointingly looking at that component on the engine that put him out of that round as Kenny Bernstein climbs out of the automobile. A happy man. He doesn't know yet 
how his lane choice is going to be for the finals, but he's ready to race as Steve Evans is about to talk with him. Kenny Bernstein, single run or not, has definitely earned his right to be in the final round here at the North Star Nationals with stunning performance. Kenny, a 597 will give lane choice over to Shytown. Well, yeah, that's okay. I think both lanes are pretty equal. He ran 95 in the left, 97. There's not much difference, but I hate to win him like that, especially with a good friend like Paul Candice, but we got to take him that way. We'll take him. You know, everybody would predict right now, knowing the shy time in their history, they'll go out and run a 595 or 596. Yeah, you can count on them being there. They've been there for, what, a year and a half now, almost two years. So uh, we're going to step it up. We're going to have to again. I think it could use a little clutch on it. Maybe would help, but we're just, you know, right there. It just needs to go a little quicker. It's going to be a great final. It sure is. <laughs> a great pair for the Funny Car Finals. Kenny Bernstein versus the world champion, Frank Hawley. We'll be back with top alcohol dragster action after this. We've got some pro stock semifinal action coming up here at the North Star Nationals in Brainerd, Minnesota. But before we do that, let's go back to Florida and Ed Bruce and Art Malone. Back at Sunshine Drag Strip in St. Petersburg, Florida with Art Malone. Art, when I was a kid growing up in Memphis, uh, I wanted to play ball or pick a guitar. Uh, you grew up in the St. Pete, Tampa area. What did you want to do as a kid? Well, as a kid, you know, I, I watched oval track racing, sprint car racing, that sort of thing. And that's what I wanted to be was a sprint car driver. And maybe, you know, my dream was to end up at Indianapolis, which I eventually did. But never had no uh, ambitions or even thoughts about drag racing. And uh, it quickly became a part of my life. And of course, I ended up going to Indy. But uh, my even uh, when I was driving in Indy, uh, I still love top fuel. So after you uh, drove at Indy, you, know, you had drag strip experience. Uh, what did you feel about when you were thinking about driving oval tracks in uh, Indianapolis? What did you think about drag racing? Well, see, drag racing really helped me at, at Indianapolis because I was used to the awesome speeds and the awesome acceleration where most guys that go to Indy come from uh, a short track somewhere and they're not used to those kind of speeds. So Indy never really impressed me, truthfully, even though I never admitted that to most of the guys. And I don't want to misrepresent Indy. I love Indy and the guys around it. Just dearly love it. It's, uh, it's a close second to top fuel. Uh, but it, it never impressed me, I think, like a lot of people, because I came from drag racing, and the, the horsepower in top fuel is just awesome. Still your life, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I love it right there. You're going to be there forever? I hope. Art Malone, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. We're going back to Brainerd, Minnesota. The modern-day pro stock is making just about as much horsepower as the top fuel dragsters that Art Malone drove in those days. And it's time for the semifinals. The Oldsmobile of Warren Johnson in the near lane. The Chevrolet from New Jersey of Frank Iaconio in the left-hand lane. Iaconio heating up his tires. Warren Johnson now holding the electric line lock that locks the front brakes so that he can stationary spin those tires and heat them up, Brock Yates. And he's got some impressive horsepower under that hood of that Oldsmobile, Steve. As you said earlier, Warren needs maybe 40 horsepower more than Frank Iaconio simply to stay competitive. As you can see, the automobile is much less aerodynamic. That's a cutlass body versus that beautiful Camaro body over there on the right-hand side of your screen of Frank Iaconio, a much more streamlined vehicle. Iaconio stays first, and that's rare. He usually likes to be last, but unpredictable is part of pro stock racing. A little bit of a mind game going on. Warren Johnson finally stages, and we have got a semifinal race. Iaconio and Johnson. Iaconio was off the starting line first ball, and it's a good thing he was. Iaconio at 788. Warren Johnson ran quicker, a 783. But Iaconio's whole shot made the difference, and you see him right here. It's also a good thing this whole thing is scored electronically, Steve, because it really would be almost impossible for the human eye to determine who the winner was. Back in the old days, he probably would have had a fist bite over who won this one. But Warren Johnson, when he gets his time slip, is going to be sick because he ran five hundreds quicker but lost it on the starting line. I said before, he thinks maybe more about the mechanics of the car than driving. All right, here it is. Ford versus Chevrolet. The fans are up for this one. Bob Glidden and the Thunderbird in the far lane. Lee Shepard in the near lane. Between the two of them, the last seven world championships. And you've got to look at the car on the right-hand side of your screen as the favorite. Lee Shepard's on a roll. As we said earlier, Bob Glidden has had a series of problems until he just came across the brand-new engine from Ford. This may make the difference for him. 
Bob Glidden was away first. Bob Glidden enjoying almost as big a hole shot as Frank Iacomio did. Here comes Shepard. And yet another photo finish in pro stock. This one won by Bob Glidden with a 789. He'll go into the finals against Frank Iaconio. But first, let's go to Steve Evans in the pits with funny car finalist Frank Hawley. You know, anytime a guy has to race you, Frank Hawley, it presents an interesting problem because he thinks he knows what you're going to do. Run him to 595 or 594, something like that, and he's got to go out and beat that time. Well, the way it's been today, uh, you know, you were saying we're real consistent. Well, almost everybody is. This guy we got a race in the final here, uh, Kenny Bernstein and Dale Armstrong and the guys, uh, they've got their own little computer going today. So, uh, you know, we're going to try and do the same thing. And, and if they do, then it's going to be a driver's race on the starting line again. They have freshened up the blower on that car, put a new supercharger on it, and that can wake up a motor sometimes. Yeah, we we do that occasionally, but uh, that can also burn up a motor sometimes too. And and uh, you know we we've been uh, accused of being a little savage sometimes, and and I think Armstrong's been accused of being a little savage too. So uh, we might see a couple cars uh, down near the finish line side by side with smoke trailing out of them because we're gonna we're gonna go out there and race too. Looking forward to it. So are we. <laughs> All right, he's at full boost, and so is this man, Kenny Bernstein. They'll go against each other in the Funny Car Finals here at the North Star Nationals. Stay with us. Here at the North Star Nationals in Brainerd, Minnesota, we've established our finalists in the Funny Car class. Now it's time to do the same among the top alcohol dragsters, the semifinals. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates and Ed Bruce visiting Art Malone down in Florida. And Steve, remember this guy, Vic Anderson from uh, Minneapolis. Remember the way that he got into this thing. First, no engine wouldn't start. Finally got it fired up seconds before the start, and then a red light from his competition. I'd like to go to Las Vegas tonight with old Vic if he's willing. I think he's got the magic touch. Well, we'll see. He's going up against the neighbor, really. Uh, Dennis Forcell, also from Minneapolis. And really, uh, if we stand on records, he's the guy that brings the big reputation into this race. He certainly does. He has far more experience in the alcohol ranks. But years ago, one of the most potent top fuel dragsters around uh, was Vic Anderson. In fact, back in the days that Art Malone was talking about, the front-motored uh, machines of the past. Now, Forcell is not backing up, Brock. Is, oh, okay. You've got to back that machine up under its own power. Well, you don't have to. If you've got a big enough, strong enough crew, I guess it could go out and push it back to the starting line, but uh, that's getting harder to do these days. <laughs> Old Buster Couch standing there watching everything that goes on, doesn't miss a thing. It's interesting. Nobody ever complains about the things that go on at the starting line, as, as we saw earlier, with the high emotions that exist down there, as with the Mark Oswald situation. Nobody ever goes after Old Buster. He's so fair and so competent at what he does that there just never is any kind of disputes or, uh, or nobody's jumping out and taking swings at Buster. Of course, he's a pretty big guy, too. Yes, he is. And uh, that's true about the whole NHRA program. They're in a very tight ship uh, of, uh, with a lot of consistency. You know the decision before you do. You don't have to ask anymore. But moving forward, and Vic Anderson kind of looked over like, where is he? My motor's getting hot. Finally, Dennis Forcell quickly comes up to the starting line. The team of Forcell and Clark, the blower belt spinning madly. The blower belt is spun almost 60% faster than the motor, Brock. They really put some RPMs into the superchargers. Well, remember, that old blower came really off the old GMC supercharged diesel engines, and uh, of course, they're much modified and radically changed, but the basic design goes way back to before World War II. It's that same technology, and the RPMs are up. Vic Anderson staring a hole in that yellow light. They get off right together. If anything, Anderson had a bit of an advantage, but something goes wrong with Anderson's car. It is Dennis Forcell at a 6.77 second elapsed time, and that won't please him. It's probably going to take quicker to win it, 205 miles an hour, but Forcell goes into the final round, and that's a pretty big payday in itself. Now, will he race this man, Don Woosley, in the yellow car from Kentucky, or will it be Daryl Gwynn in the other lane? That will be the question, because at the present time, these two men are the major forces in top alcohol dragster. Woolsley. Daryl Gwynn there, both getting ready to go. And in the meantime, let's go to Steve Evans with Dennis Forcell. Dennis Forcell wrapping the chute, getting ready to head back to the pits to prepare for the final round. Dennis, it's been a long dry spell between final rounds and big competition for you. Well, it certainly has. <laughs> it's going to be a good one. Tell us about this race here just now. Well, I think Vic definitely got out on me, and uh, yes, something went wrong with his car at half track, so we were able to take the win. I think that uh, without him uh, having a problem, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the starting line and see who you're going to face in the final. All right. 
Very gracious observation by Dennis Forcell because he probably was a loser until Anderson's engine went away. All right, the young Darrell Gwynn backs up. He is getting stronger and stronger. It'll be very interesting, though, to see how he runs against his arch rival, Don Wolseley. They've raced against each other repeatedly over the last few seasons, Steve. They certainly have, Brock. Daryl Gwynn learned to drive one of these cars quicker than any young man I think I've ever seen. If there's such a thing as a natural given talent, Daryl Gwynn's got it. All across the sport of automobile racing, we're seeing second generation drivers coming in in the Indy car racing, stock car racing, and now in drag racing as the kid gets ready. A violent dry burn out to the starting line. Back to that subject, Brock. I think it's because they were around the cars all their life, and there's, they're not intimidated by them in the least. No, they're not. And, of course, they've seen the technical side of this thing grow. They've learned how to wrench these cars and work on them. Don Wolseley, much more the veteran, though. But with the stronger car is Daryl Gwynn. Daryl Gwynn, number two in the world in the far lane. Gwynn and Wolseley. It is a red light for Daryl Gwynn. Daryl Gwynn has red lighted Don Woosley. The second car across the finish line will go into the final round. Woosley at 6.62 seconds. We heard Daryl earlier talking about red lighting that it was the car's fault. Picking the front wheels up. Well, apparently they had not repaired that chassis or modified it to stop that because it did it again. Daryl Gwynn is out. So the final round in top alcohol dragster will see Dennis Forsell versus Don Woosley. Brock has been down there talking to Woosley and has found out there's some bad news. Oh, we had ourselves a little uh, bad news here after we got through with that uh, little conversation a second ago. Uh, looks like the motor's uh, real hurt. Yeah, it kicked the rod out. You can't. There's no way to get it fixed. I know. So he's got a single run. Huh? Right. Okay. We're sorry. How painful it's going to be when the time comes for that man to watch a single for Dennis Forsell. We'll be back with the Pro Stock semifinals here at the North Star Nationals. Stay with us. We're back at Brainerd, Minnesota, the North Star Nationals, where we've seen some wild alcohol funny car action. Let's go to Steve Evans with Fred Mandolini. Well, Fred Mandolini's crew got down here in a hurry, and they're already headed back to the pits. This has got to be the greatest season of drag racing a guy could ask for for you so far. Nah, we've been doing fairly well. Yeah, I'll say. Uh, the, the man to beat, though, is right there. <laughs> Talking about Ace Monto. You got it. That looks like the, the man to beat at this race, I'd say. As far as consistency and stuff, Frankie's about the best here. And uh, at what point could you get him if you continue? Uh, I, I won't see him till the final. If we get that far. Yeah, if we get that far. Tell me about this last race. Uh, it, it seems like it's down on power quite a bit. I'm not sure what's causing that either. It, it could just be the, the air. It's pretty hot and muggy today. Boy, it sure is. We'll see you down here. Hope to see you later. So as Fred Mandolini heads back to the pits to get ready for the next round, this is the man he was referring to, the automobile of Ace Manzo, actually Frank Manzo from Morganville, New Jersey, Steve, and he too is one of the very best in this league of racing. Yes, he is, Brock. In fact, he wears his credentials uh, as the number on the car. Number two means he was number two in the world championship last year. His competition, and believe me, I've never seen this car before, it is Jim Nielsen. And if there's a long distance award, Jim gets it. He's from Kona, Hawaii. Yeah, you got to wonder why Jim came all the way to Minnesota to compete. You know, there are a lot of big racers in California that only be halfway as far away from home as this one. But the Night Witch of Jim Nielsen, a very interesting looking automobile. And Jim, kind of an unknown quantity here. Come a long way from home to race one of the big names in alcohol funny cars, Frank Manzo from Morganville, New Jersey, number two in the world right now in this category, Steve. As we look at the Night Witch from Kona, Hawaii, Brock, uh, drag racing very popular in the islands. In fact, there are four tracks, and instead of a trailer, you need a boat, really. Because the tracks are all on uh, different islands, the most prominent of which is Hawaii Raceway Park outside of Honolulu. But, you know, you can race all you want regionally in your own hometown, but until you've been to an NHRA national event, you really haven't been to a drag race. Nielsen's car actually started life as a 1982 Corvette, and there is some resemblance down in there somewhere, Steve. Well, a little more resemblance here, Brock, to an 83 Trans Am. This is as fine an alcohol funny car as you could build. No expense has been spared on this automobile. And I would tell you, it's probably self-supporting the amount of money that Ace Monzo won last year, an incredibly successful alcohol funny car racer. Monzo is in the construction business in New Jersey, Jim Nielsen in the left-hand lane. I hope he owns a travel agency. Coming all the way from Kona, Hawaii has got to be expensive. 
Ace Monzo, the heavy favorite here, just based on his past history in drag racing. They move into the electronic main stage and ready the flash of the tree. Ace Monzo, an automatic winner. The gentleman from Hawaii left too soon. Monzo wins it at 6.62 seconds, 206 miles an hour. And again, much like Gary Southern, that was kind of a calculated red light. Monzo was so much quicker in qualifying that Nielsen just had to try to get the advantage if he was to stay in this drag race. Well, back in the starting line area, already fired and ready, is Vern Motes of Des Moines, Iowa. You talk about veterans. Mote has been drag racing for 25 years. He's going to get a gift here in this round as his competition, Jack White, has not shown up. Brock Yates is down in the pit area to try to find out why. Uh, Jack White, it's, uh, it's one thing to lose. Uh, it's another thing just not to be able to make the starting line, and that's what happened to you here. What, uh, what exactly transpired? Well, uh, on our second qualifying at pass, we were still in the program, which was real well, but uh, just out of the trailer, we had a lot of, you know, a lot of changes we could make to make the car go quicker. And uh, on a, on a, when we left the starting line, a rod broke and it, and it busted the block, which we didn't have another block with us. We had everything else, but we didn't have a block. That's too bad. That's pretty rare in an alcohol car, isn't it, to tear a block up like that? Yeah, usually we've been, this is the second time it's done it, so we've got a problem, something that we're going to have to find and see what the, what's causing it. I've had several runs on that motor, but uh, we checked it all over before we came up and stuff, and we've got something we're looking over, something that's causing it. So you just, uh, you knew yesterday, as of yesterday, you just weren't, you were out of the show, huh? Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. We, uh, we checked around for blocks and stuff. Most of the guys that come here is going to use up, you know, a lot of their parts, too, so that you don't want to part with anything that, you know, they're going to may need later on in the race. Right. Yeah. Well, it happens to everybody, the best of them, and we're sorry it happened to you, Jack, but I we'll hope to see you back here soon. We'll be back. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, unfortunately, the cost of running an alcohol funny car is going to rise very quickly because they're going to have to start carrying spare motors as much as the pros do if they're going to stay competitive. Now, Vern Motes, you talk about competitive. This man has recorded some of the quickest elapsed times ever seen in this category, and that is truly amazing when you consider two years ago he was in a hospital in Florida uh, after a very bad crash. One of the most serious in drag racing history, people say, but now he's fully recovered and back to full effectiveness at the wheel of his alcohol funny car. So, Vern Motes, a single run this time. Let's go to Steve Evans with Frank Manzo. Well, Frank, everybody coming down here is complaining to their crews, no power. What if it's just the weather change? Uh, I think the weather has a lot to do with it. Uh, the high altitude is hurting us alcohol guys a little bit. Um, we've been trying all weekend. We made this is the fifth run on the car. We run between 664 and 661. No matter what we change, just stuck on 62, 61. Maybe if I just get a little better driving, we could win the race with a 61. Fred Mandolini says you're the guy to beat here today. Well, he's low, low, low ET and number one qualifier. Low ET first round, he's number one qualifier. So uh, I think he's the guy to beat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mutual admiration society here as Vern Motes gets ready for a single pass. But again, it's critical because they do get lane choice uh, based on ETs in these particular runs. Is that right, Steve? That's exactly right, Brock. And it's up to the racer. He can idle down the racetrack or he can run 215 miles an hour. It's his choice. Will he go for lane choice? Is it that important? I think it is. Let's see what Vern decides. A good luck. He appears to be going for it. Vern Mode shifts into high gear, absolutely going for it. An elapsed time of 6.67. That will probably give him lane choice. So the big guns in Alcohol Funny Car go into the semifinals. Motes versus Mandolini, Monzo versus Barney. Now let's go to Ed Bruce in St. Petersburg, Florida. He's with one of the former greats in top fuel drag racing. Top fuel dragsters. Oh, they are fast. The first really high performance category in drag racing, I guess. Doing what I do, it's not often I get to sit here with a legend. If you've ever been to the drag strip, you know the name, Art Malone. Art, good to see you. Good to Thank be here you. with you. Thank you. How did you get started in drag racing? Well, in 1959, my lifelong friend Don Garlitz was burned in a top fuel accident, and I took over the driving chores for him for about six months, and then uh, built my own car with a partner, Al Williams, in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, shortly thereafter bought him out and uh, went on my own. When did the top fuel dragsters start? Top Fuel uh, probably started uh, in about uh, the middle 50s, as far as I know. I became involved with it in 59 and uh, carried on until about 1970 as a profession. We're going to get back a little bit later and tell you about uh, some of the things that happened with Art in those first few weeks of drag racing in Top Fuel Drag. So right now, we're going back to Brainerd. 
Thank you, Ed. No question about it. Art Malone was one of the greatest drag racers of the 1960s. We have the greatest drag racers of the 1980s here in Brainerd, Minnesota. We'll be back with more action right after this. The preliminaries are over with. It's time for the final rounds here at the NHRA North Star Nationals in Brainerd, Minnesota. I'm Steve Evans with Brock Yates and Ed Bruce is down in Florida. Brock, it's time for the competition eliminator final. This beautiful 83 Firebird of David Nickens from Houston, Texas will be going up against the C Economy dragster of Gary Wenzel from Kiwana, Indiana. Really couldn't have two cars that were more unlike each other, Steve. This really pretty uh, 83 Firebird going up against that little rail dragster. What a contrast. They call them economy dragsters uh, because they are required to use an automatic transmission, a single four-barrel carburetor. They're only allowed certain cylinder head modifications. Originally, it was intended to be a very affordable class, but leave it to the racers. That car is probably worth 30000 bucks now. <laughs> well... That's the wonderful thing about drag racing, really, is I guess you could almost build anything and bring it to the races, and the NHRA will find a class for it somewhere. The Firebird has the advantage under the handicap system. The dragster trying to close. The tortoise and the hare, it is the hare. The dragster wins it from Kiwana, Indiana. That is Gary Wenzel, the competition eliminator champion. 8.42 seconds, 160 miles an hour. As we see the comp final again, watch the Firebird and the Christmas tree. Nickens does not cut a very good light. Maybe a little uh, paranoid about red lighting. A foul start would put him out instantly. Instead, he's just a little late. The dragster, Gary Wenzel, takes full advantage of that. He cut a much better light, and Gary Wenzel drives right by the Firebird to take the competition eliminator title. And Brock is with the happy champ. All right. Got a happy crew coming in behind you, Harry. This is the first time in a winter circle, isn't it? Sure is. How's it feel? Oh, great. It's starting to feel good already, huh? Sure does. <laughs> how'd, how'd the run go? Did the rain bother the car? Are you at all? No, not a bit. You, were you psyched up and ready to go and then had to shut it down? Did that didn't bother you, though, no, huh? No, not too much. Okay. Well, then, uh, congratulations. Super job. Thank you. Okay. Well, he couldn't help but be a little bit concerned about the on and off sprinkles we've been having here. But the track is dry and ready now for the top alcohol funny car final. This should be a super race. Frank Monzo will be in the near lane from New Jersey. In the far lane, the crowd favorite, I'm sure, the red, white, and blue car from Des Moines, Iowa, Vern Motes. Brock had a chance to talk to both drivers just before they got into their cars. Fern, uh, you, you ran real strong ET and a good top speed in that last round. Uh, but since then, we had a little short rain shower. Is that going to affect your plans in any way about fuel mixtures or blower boost or the rest of it? I don't think so. The humidity is still up. It was up before. Uh, usually it could hurt the track, but uh, it's been so warm that it'll dry right out. I don't think we'll have any problem. Did you... Uh, have you made any serious changes? Or you kept the car pretty much the way it is. No, we we stepped on it. We're yeah, gonna yeah. try to run a 50 and drive around them if we can. How about uh, how about this weather? It, uh, sprinkle a little bit, maybe, but the humidity didn't seem to go down at all. Does that uh, have any effect on the way you set the car up? Uh, I feel myself the track could get uh, a little slippery, so I uh, made a little change in the clutch, hoping that if Ern is making as much power as he's been, he could turn the tires a little bit, and I could put a half a car on him and win the race. Well, the comments of the drivers themselves make this an even more interesting final. This man, Frank Monzo, said, we stepped on it. We hopped it up to try to match his 6.57 elapsed time. Vern Motes wisely left his car alone. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, is the motto, Brock. You're right, Steve. And, of course, he's got that five one-hundredths of a second ET on uh, Frank based on their last two runs. And in this kind of racing, that's uh, that's almost a lifetime. That's a big, big advantage. So certainly the ball is in Frank's court to match that kind of an ET. Vern Motes moves into stage first. Monzo, who likes to stage last, gets his wish. They leave right together. They are dead even at half track. Here is Vern Motes. Vern Motes by a little over a car length at 6.63 seconds. Vern Motes is the North Star Nationals Funny Car Champion. Just as good a race as we had hoped for. Watch him here. Let's see if we can see any advantage. Not really. They appeared to leave as one. Frank Monzo staying right where they make them see each other at this point. But about half track is when Vern Motes starts to make his move. Vern Motes pulling away from Frank Monzo, and Brock is with him. Vern Motes out of his car. Got to be a happy man as he unbuckles his helmet and takes off his fire suit. 
Frank Manzo comes over to pass along a congratulation. Vern, nice run, 667, real strong. Uh, how'd it feel all the way down the track? Well, it was a little bit different, being that we had all that rain they just cleaned up, but I thought it felt pretty good, but there wasn't quite the bite that we had when we left the time before. Rain didn't really affect the run, though? No? Oh, a little bit, yes. Uh -huh. It must uh, it must be psychologically a little hard to get right up there and get get the motor running and fire it up and ready to stage and then uh, shut it all down and sit in the... Do you sit in the car or do you get out of the car? We got out of the car, but you kind of get psyched up and it's kind of a letdown. It's hard uh, to get back at it. I'll bet. Well, it'll, it'll probably come to you now, and uh, congratulations on winning here at Brainerd. Super job. Thank you. Thousands of dollars and a lot of prestige at stake as it's finals time at the North Star Nationals. The winner in the top alcohol dragster class is a foregone conclusion. It's this man, Dennis Forcell, who has a buy run, a single run, because his competition, Don Woosley, hurt the motor too badly to make it to the starting line. Brock Yates? Well, he's got all day to do it, but he's going to stand on it. He could theoretically just push that thing down there, Steve, but he's going to make a good, strong pass. A 675, 203 miles an hour. Dennis Forcell takes himself home a little money back to Minneapolis and a pretty nice trophy as well. Well, there was no pressure in that particular final, but wait till you see this one. Frank Iaconio and Bob Glidden. Ford versus Chevrolet, the Chevrolet of Iaconio from New Jersey. And both of these drivers earned their right to get into the final round via hole shots. In fact, they both had slower elapsed times in the semis. Amazing. Here is the sleek Ford Thunderbird of Bob Glidden. When the two have met over the past years, the edge on the starting line would have to go to Iaconio. The edge elapsed time-wise to Glidden. So this could be one of those famous photo finishes, Brock. But maybe, Steve, we've got a few seconds to wait because these guys have been known to play mind games with each other on the line. Glidden's doing that right now. Finally, Glidden is in, and it is Glidden away first. A tremendous pro stock. Final is underway. Bob Glidden, Ford, Farley, Frank Iaconio, Chevrolet. It is Glidden by a half a car. 787, 176 miles an hour. Iaconio runs even quicker, but he was late off the starting line. A 785 for Frank Iaconio, but it's not good enough because of what you see over there in the left-hand side of your screen, that beautiful blue and white Thunderbird, uh, Bob Glidden's out first, and he's the winner. Well, Glidden staged last. He made Frankie wait, maybe got him a little rattle. Glidden, when he came in, was ready, poised, and when the light flashed, he was gone like a rocket. So Bob Glidden wins the Pro Stock Finals at the North Star Nationals, and down at the far end, Brock Gates is with him. Fantastic work. You know, uh, he ET'd you by, uh, uh, you had a 787, he had a 785, but you had a 500s on him coming out. You really hole shot at him, huh? Well, it was close. Uh, I think maybe the the, the rain kind of turned the lanes around. You know, the, the left lane was down just a little bit, and uh, I believe the rain was to my favor. Is that right? Well, so you... the, the, the rain, the, you know, cooled the track off a little, and then when they come by with the, uh, the dryer, uh, we really hooked well. Well, that's the best run we've made all day. Yeah, well, you were, uh, you were going, uh, you, were, you were kind of all over the lot up until now, and I know I talked to you before, you were not happy, and you, I thought, boy, if we're going to put some money on Bob Glidden, you better take a long shot, but uh, it really worked out well, huh? Oh, great. Well, we picked up a little bit each run. Yeah. Uh, I guess Frank picked up a little of that run, but... Yeah, uh, Frank ran real strong. It was our day to win, I guess, finally. Well, congratulations. Third time this year. It's got to feel good. Really good. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So Bob gives a little credit to NHRA, who used their track dryer to put some heat in the racetrack while we were away just before that post-doc final. Terrific race, and we can expect the same thing, I think, here, Brock. Kenny Bernstein in the near lane up against Frank Hawley, the reigning world champion. These two guys, uh, well, you talk to them, and they are up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember they used to talk about in the old days tipping the can. These guys tip the can, tighten the clutch. Uh, pumped up the blower boost. They've got everything going. They are really ready to race. Of course, Holly, as you said before, Steve, he tends to remain very consistent. You wonder how much he and Austin Coyle have really done to that car. And Kenny Bernstein's crew has been working towards that same kind of consistency, only hoping for 580s instead of 90s. The last time these two met was the season finale last year in San Francisco, and it was Bernstein off the mark first and beat Holly, who ran a quicker elapsed time, and Holly was just destroyed by that. He's got takes a lot of pride in his driving. He sure does. In fact, uh, he really, like Kenny Bernstein, concentrates almost exclusively on driving. He is a pro driver, so is Kenny Bernstein. Sometimes we see guys that will behave both as uh, drivers and mechanics, not these two. 
Well, Frank Hawley was a mechanic on the car, but when he won the world championship, that was a little bonus that Austin gave him. He doesn't have to lay on his back with hot oil running in his eyes anymore. He gets to fly into the races sometimes to stay kind of clean and really look like the professional that he is. Mike Guger, one of the crew people for Kenny Bernstein, helping Kenny stage that car. And right now, you can bet these guys are just holding their breath concentrating, trying to get that mental advantage to leave before the other driver. They are pre-staged. No games here. They move right in. Bernstein inching forward. It's funny car final time. And they do leave right together. Both drivers tremendously alert. Bernstein and Holly. It is, it is Bernstein by a fender. At 592, his drought comes to an end. Take a look at a classic funny car drag race. The reaction times of the drivers virtually equal. Both cars arrow straight down the drag strip. It's possible that Frank Holly had a slight lead at half track, but it was the superior horsepower of Kenny Bernstein that brought him to a half a length victory here at Brainerd. Coming out of his steaming, smoking funny car, Kenny Bernstein, who wins his first national event of this season. He won one last year as well. And a lot of hard work has gone into a tremendous effort this weekend. That consistency that usually only the Chi-Town has was matched by you, Kenny, today. Well, I tell you, I got to take it. Armstrong and the crew, Guru, they did it this last round. We changed a lot of stuff, as you know, Steve, and Dale had her on there. It was good. Now, he ran a 596, right? Well, you figured he'd run, right. but you ran better than 92. Well, we thought with the new blower, if it would work, if just hang in there, it might help us, and it did. And, again, that's Armstrong because he makes those decisions. Well, congratulations again. A great side-by-side -side final, and I tell you, the place went crazy when this car won. The fans love you. Well, super. Thank you. And listen, the Chi-Town and those guys, they've got nothing to be ashamed about. They're there all the time. <laughs> great. Kenny Bernstein, he did it here at the North Star Nationals. Hey, right, uh, Just to get into a final round of one of these races is quite an accomplishment. Brock's with Frank. Super run. You had him by 100th out of the hole, and uh, everybody thought you were going to take him. He, you, had a, you were a 96. He was a 92. Yeah, well, there's not much you can say about it when you lose, but uh, those guys, they did a fine job today. They well, deserve to win the race. You did a super job, too. Congratulations. You're a fine winner and a super champion. Well, we got another 800 points, so that's important, too. That helps a lot. Thanks okay. A lot. Good job, Frank. We saved the very fastest to the last here at Brainerd, Minnesota, the North Star Nationals top fuel final. Steve, a pair of relative unknowns, but men that are going to make their mark in this sport very quickly. I'll tell you what, Brock, if Doug Kerhul is the car we're looking at, wins this race, the small, quiet town of Brainerd, Minnesota will never be the same again. He is a wild man. And you know, momentum, a cliche, I guess, but momentum also translates into confidence. And that's something Joe Amato has. He's in the opposite lane. He comes in here with two straight victories to his credit. The Grand National in Montreal, the Summer Nationals in New Jersey. He's definitely on a streak. The team is very, very well buttoned up. The car runs well, and he is a fine driver. So you've got to, if you had to pick a favorite between these two, it would, I suppose that it'd have to be Amato, right? It would be a motto, uh, particularly from an elapsed time standpoint. He has been in the 560s. Krahulis has not. Krahulis got a gift in round one. He earned his race in round two. And now it's time for the final. They are pre-stage. Krahulis is in. Amato's in. We've got a race. Amato is again smoking the tire. Krahulis has engine problems from behind. Joe Amato wins the North Star Nationals 5.75, 247 miles an hour. Brock, when Amato smoked the tires, I thought he was beaten. Absolutely, Steve. In fact, it looked as if Doug had all the best of it right from the start. He may have squeezed the light a little bit better than Amato. And then Amato got the tires up and smoke a little bit. And Kerholis over there in the far lane is going just dead straight perfect. And then it happens. We see smoke from the left bank of his engine. That means a burned piston. And there, Joe Amato drives by for the victory. He's the winner. You won it with great precision. You burned very few pieces up. You were the second quickest car. Uh, Gary, only Gary Beck ran quicker, and he's in another zone somewhere. Yeah, Beck is a little different, but we didn't hurt anything all weekend. We kept putting the same pistons back in. We had to change just very little parts, and that's the key, to be able to tune the car and keep the thing running consistent, and that's, what's, that's our, our success story. Beck can run fast, but he can't do it every time, and that's, that's, the, that's when you're going the times he's going and the performance, that's what the, the price you pay. Congratulations, Joe, on three straight NHRA championship victories. Doug Kerhulis put up the good fight. Let's see how he feels with Brock Yates. Uh, you, you whole shot at him. You did super job, but he just uh, drove past you. Yeah, you know, I 
mean, I'm so happy to be in the final to be runner-up, but I mean, uh, I thought it was mine. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it I just... don't even know what it ran, but I mean, it, it quit about 600, 700 feet, but it, we gave it our best shot, and I'm just glad to be here. You just couldn't bury your foot any deeper in that thing. No, I've probably been it. That in the frame, too, right? Yeah, no, we gave her a good shot. We just, we tried, just gave up the ghost. It was about probably 900 foot, and then I went up and put a, put, pulled the high speed, and then he just come by me. Needed one more gear, huh? See ya. Okay, Tiny. congratulations, Andy. Thank you very much. Super job. Okay, thank Fantastic. you very much. With the enthusiasm of a Doug Grahulis, you can bet his time will come. Jerry Amato congratulating husband Joe, as Brock said earlier, a very close couple that truly enjoys their drag racing as a recreation. Joe Amato wins top fuel, burn modes, alcohol, funny car. Gary Wenzel wins competition eliminator. For Ed Bruce here. down in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Brock Yates, I'm Steve America. Evans. So long from Brainerd, Minnesota. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Pallage. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship Team, the nation's premier source of fast lane fashion. Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life. American Sports Cavalcade is a presentation of Diamond V Sports.